All right, we're recording. Good evening. My name is Benjamin Hatfield. I'm a technical dive instructor with Idaho Dive Pirates and Teach Me to Dive. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about deep diving um, and understanding the uh, the mysteries of deep diving. My qualifications teach this. I'm a technical instructor as well as an assistant instructor trainer um, with SSI. So as we go through this, um, I always like to kind of point out and make sure that people know that a lot of times the pictures you'll see in the in my presentations are actual photos um, that I took or I'm in um, <laughs> and, uh, to make it a little bit more personal. But I also want you to think about where do you want your diving journey to go? What does that look like to you? So uh, just give you a quick couple of ideas here. This is some of the specialties I can teach. I think last time I looked, I can teach 36 specialties, something like that, um, as well as technical diving. Uh, the only two specialties I cannot teach are, um, let's see, I cannot teach DPV because I don't have a DPV. I have used the DPV. It's pretty awesome, but haven't have wanted to spend six grand on a DPV for Idaho. It's just not something I wanted to do. Um, and I don't teach um, uh, gas blending. There's just not a lot of opportunity for gas blending out here, so I just don't do it. But um, those are the only two specialties that I do not teach personally. Um, ev everything else you'll see on SSI, I can definitely teach. But this is kind of a quick list. I mean, there's all kinds of cool stuff in here. Ice diving and dry suit. I do a lot of ice diving. I do a lot of dry suit diving. Solo diving is one of my favorites to teach. I do teach wreck diving and advanced wreck diving. Um, search and recovery. Altitude diving is a great one. Navigation is fun. Science. I really love science of diving. So just think about where you want your diving career to go. Um, and let's talk about it. Make sure that we're helping you get to the direction you want to go in your diving career. Um, tonight, we're going to use the Diver Diamond Philosophy, which is an SNSI teaching method. And what I'm going to do is we're going to build up some knowledge. Um, we're going to talk about and develop some skills. We're going to discuss and use equipment and experience. And for me, experience comes in two folds. Um, experience, first of all, is give you experience doing the whatever you're doing, right? But in my opinion, experience needs to be twofold. And the other one is you need to have a good experience doing it. Um, and if you don't have a good experience doing what you're doing and... and uh, then why are you doing it, right? You want to make sure that everything's uh, positive and fun. So I'm going to try to make sure that this is fun for you guys as well. Um, overall, so the the way we do this is we're going to start training. We're going to develop, some, learn some skills, develop some ability, do some water sessions, review and learn, review and learn, and become a safer diver. Overall, so tomorrow's going to be a lot of fun. Um, my expectations of you are going to be participate in the classroom. We're going to only do one. Um, one classroom. We're going to do three open water dives tomorrow. We're going to do 60 feet plus, 80 feet plus, and 100 foot plus. The good news is um, if you've got the books, uh, please go through all the books. And the, <laughs> the final exam is online. Um, so uh, I will test you and quiz you throughout this to make sure that we understand what we're talking about. But your final exam is online in the app. So you'll just need to make sure you look at every page in the app as well as take the time to uh, do the final exam. It's uh, not hard. Um, you just have to pass with an 80% or better. Um, and so must finish better. Yes, sir. The final exam is different than the one we already took? It's the one right in the book. Uh, right, oh, okay. right in, in the online. That's that's the final exam that you'll be taking. Okay. So, so we already took that then. Awesome. Good, perfect. So again, I'll be quizzing you throughout just to make sure understand of information as well. All right, cool. And we want to make sure you have fun. If you're not having fun, please tell me. Um, one of the things I do like, um, I live, live and die on reviews. So if you think I'm an awesome instructor, please go to Idaho Dive Pirates uh, Facebook page and teach me to dive Facebook page and give us a review as well as our, on Google. If you think I'm awesome, give me a five star. If you don't think I'm awesome, don't give me a five star. All I ask is integrity um, as well. As we go through this, guys, um, what is your expectation out of this class? Uh, learning, I guess. I'm not really sure. <laughs> it's all kind of new. I mean, we did go through all the homework stuff on the SSI app and kind of learned. I mean, me mostly. He has researched a lot, but I learned a lot about the deep diving. And so I'm excited to, you know, do the class with you and, and get that experience. Awesome. Perfect. David, what's your expectation? So basically to learn to dive deep safely and uh, help her get more comfortable doing so, so so that we can do more dives to more places and have a lot of fun. Awesome. That, that Those are good expectations. My next question becomes, what's your expectation from me? 
by the way, these are all pictures of dumb things I've done. This is me with shark. <laughs> so that's uh, my wife with a turtle. That's my wife. With, I think that's me with a uh, shark over here. Um, so all kinds of dumb things in case you're wondering. <laughs> cool. What's your expectation of me? Um, Help us learn. Yeah. <laughs> give, give us the information we need to dive safely. To dive safely and to have fun. Carry it. it forward in our life. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I can. I think we can certainly do that. Um, overall, so this is the type of water we'll be seeing tomorrow is green water and it'll be dark. So hopefully, you guys have flashlights as well. We do. We do. Yep. How, we'll, how dark does it get? Just curious. Um, nighttime dark, <laughs> like middle of the night in okay. a in uh, the middle of the, in middle of nowhere dark. Okay. Cool. Uh, yeah, it'll it'll definitely be dark. All right, um, we're going to talk about the total diving system. By the way, this is my daughter with Santa Claus. Uh, we're going to talk about the exposure system, the delivery system, the information system, buoyancy system, and the accessory system uh, as we go through this process. So, um, special equipment that you're going to need for this is going to be lights, um, dive tables, uh, and slates. Yeah, dive uh, dive table uh, slates are definitely handy. Um, I do carry a couple slates with me. Um, yeah, I happen to have my bag. I was just um, packing my bag um, this afternoon, as a matter of fact. Um, but I carry a couple slates with me um, for different things as well. Um, and you can see I write stuff down, what we're going to accomplish. I've got some math on there for you guys. As we go through, I do have a pencil and I can write on the on uh, my slate as well. So if we see something interesting and you ask me, you see, you say, that, what is that, that fish over there? Um, I will pull my slate out. I'll write on it, fish. If I'm feeling particularly uh, amorous of, uh, for that day, I might write yellow fish. Um, but uh, I have the, I do have the ability to communicate with you underwater. Um, okay. So, and I will, I have our dive plans already written out as well. So that's all taken care of. Nice, easy peasy lemon squeezy. Um, and I've got a couple drills for us to do as well. So. Easy peasy. I keep, I will have those with me. I will be driving being a dry suit. Just I tip, I typically dive what my students dive, but because I've got um, the plans to do, sounds like uh, seven or eight dives tomorrow. I will be in the water a lot, so I'm going to drive a dry suit if you don't mind terribly. Um, it just makes oh, yeah. my enjoyment uh, that much better and uh, um, is safer for me as your instructor as well. Um, other things you're going to want, you know, certainly uh, divers tools, uh, making sure you're safe as well. Um, and spare parts kits as well. So one of the things I do encourage is for you to have a save and I have kit. I don't, I don't you might already have one. Um, this is my save and I have school kit. I'm not going to open it because it will go flying everywhere, but I've got wrenches in here, screwdrivers. Um, one of the cool things, I do keep super glue in here. I also keep uh, a torch, um, a bra brazing torch and a, a cigarette lighter. I keep some zip ties. Little dumb things in there, so I definitely encourage that. This, this actually travels with me and has been around the world, so um, it's kind of ugly, and I've lost tools out of it, had to replace it. Um, I can tell you, I'm going to open it up and show you one of the most useful tools that I have purchased that I absolutely love. Has been, well, there's two of them. So I got these for $8 over at um, Harbor Freight. Um, they got a nice little button, and they adjust. They have been worth their weight in gold there. It's the most awesome multi use tool that I have. And then you can also buy yourself a nice little dive kit um, as well. It's got a couple wrenches on it. It's got some Allen wrenches on it. It's got a little pick on it. Um, I think it's about 10 bucks, 10 or 15 bucks. So those are a couple of the suggestions I would encourage. Um, the biggest thing that I can tell you about deep diving is deep diving is about preparation. Not just going, getting up one day and saying, hey, I think we're going to go out to 130 feet. Let's see what that looks like today. And and not doing type of gas management, right? Or any kind of preparation. So little things and little preparation goes a long way to making your dives a lot better. So definitely a good thing to have. I also keep some O-rings in there and I've, I've got a few different things. So I could do some re, um, regulator repair out on, on site if I needed to. I don't prefer to, but little things. It's, it's all about the little things. I like to think of diving as like going to the prom. It was never about the dress uh, for my sister or uh, the tux for me when I go to the prom, it was about all the other cool stuff, the cool shoes, the limo, the, um, the flower, the boutonniere, the, da, 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 da. I was all the other crap that went along with it. Right. Um, you know, for my sister, it was about the necklace and the hairstyle and the, and the purse and the stockings and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the, and the right. So that's kind of what diving's like. It's not really about 
the BC. It's about the dive knife and the save it. I have kit and the, the light, the, you can see, I've got a computer. It, uh, let's see. There it is right, right behind me, right behind as well. Um, so it's all about the, the ancillary items as well. So just kind of be aware. That's kind of how diving works um, overall. So definitely make sure that we, we do a little bit of preparation. We're going to talk about a lot more about that preparation as we, as we go along. So the importance of a good diving system, the importance of purchase from an authorized dealer. A lot of times when, especially diving, um, you find yourselves in more remote locations. Uh, I tend to do a lot of high mountain and high elevation diving, but I also do um, diving where we're, we're diving cool places like um, Hawaii, you know, we're, um, that we, we, Nikki and I went, we drove an hour and a half south of Kona um, to this little beach called Black Pebble Beach. Beautiful, beautiful beach. Um, pulling into the, the parking spaces, there was a, enough room for three cars to park. It was that small a beach. We got out there. There was one person on the beach. When we came out of our dive uh, three hours later, there was uh, uh, two people on the beach. It really kind of packed up, right? Um, but if something had happened, <laughs> happened we would uh, yeah, we, we love that kind of stuff. We uh, we dive Yellowstone all the time. So we like those remote locations, but that's kind of the nature of diving. You're just kind of out there in the middle of nowhere. So making sure you get that stuff for an authorized dealer, you get scuba quality stuff. And and just because it says scuba doesn't mean that they're just overpricing. It means they're making higher quality stuff. So I, I definitely encourage taking a look at scuba quality um, stuff as well. Um, some of the things that to dev, uh, once you do get your stuff on a regular basis, um, I check my stuff all the time, but as a uh, as a non repair type person, uh, about once a year, bring your system in and have the delivery system, um, the information system, the your BC, um, everything checked over. Um, we have a full on tech in shop, um, and we're able to that stuff over. Um, I like to do it once a year. Um, I go through everything just hardcore, but I do it on a regular basis as well. But I also do just before any trip, about three weeks before a trip. That way, if I need a part, I've got time to order it um, as well. So a few weeks before any trip, I also do a full inspection of my gear to make sure it's going to service and do well. So um, we're going to go through, we're going to talk a little bit about the support element of diving and diving deep. The first part is going to be support personnel. And, and I kind of like the caver's idea of this. And, and uh, there's the caver's rule of when you go diving, you tell uh, three people when you're going who you're going with, um, when you're actually going to start your dive and when you should be back, right? Support personnel. I mean, it's really important to let somebody else know and you never go alone. You always make sure there's somebody there with you as well. Now in, in deep diving, um, and you know, what you'll find a lot of times, you're gonna use a descent line or, or an ascent line and that's a great way to do it. Uh, in shore diving, um, we don't generally do that, um, especially with newer divers. And here's why is uh, typically inland diving, you deal with a lot of turbidity in that first 40 to 50 feet. Um, and it can be really nerve wracking on a newer diver um, as they're starting to do their dive, because all of a sudden you'll get down 10 feet. You won't be able to see the surface. You won't be able to see below you and you'll start losing visibil um, visibility around you. So you, it's hard to make that judgment of where I'm at, who I'm at and what's going on. Now in deep diving in the ocean, it's a lot different. You go down that line, it's really nice. It helps keep you on site. A lot of times when you're doing those deeper dives, you're dealing with a current. So um, as you're going down, you want to make sure that you're going down face to face, hand over hand, right? And careful, you take your time. You, you're using that descent line to your advantage, um, keeping an eye on your depth, keeping an eye on your buddy, keep an eye on everything that's going around. Our goal is not to go down as fast as possible, or even more importantly, not to come up as fast as possible. We use that that hand to hand, face to face in the diver position. Um, at all times. And really, I mean, what that, that's going to look like is literally you're going to be head to head. And, and as I'm looking, if um, you were my dive buddy, we would be literally in the in that trim position, nice with a nice hover, but we'd be hand to hand, face to face coming up that line and we could stop as we needed to, to make sure we're doing that correct ascent. Um, so using a set line or a John line is definitely a huge thing. They're kind of giving you a little bit of example. You can use an anchor line or a John line. It's all the same thing. But if you have that opportunity, don't be afraid to use that. Um, some of my favorite wrecks in the world use a John line. Um, some of the trickiest dives I do um, in the world are when I do the deep dives where we're hoping to hit the right spot. So if you have the opportunity, use use that. Um, a safety stop uh, on a cylinder line is a nice way to go. If you're in a specific area, um, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll drop at 
put a drop line or a drop tank um, out there for you. So if something happens and you misjudge your gas, um, they'll put that out there for you. And uh, so you have something in an emergency situation. So as you start doing your deep dives, ask, hey, what's what's the policy with a, with a drop tank or, or a, uh, an emergency cylinder? And, and talk to them about that. Um, the another nice thing with using a drop line or a line like this is that it gives you the opportunity to, to do all your safety stop as well. You no longer have to think about the hover, right? You get to your 20 foot safety stop, you hang, you, you grab the line in that specific spot and it's nice because you, you, you no longer have to think. I just, um, a lot of times when I get on it, if I've got a long one is I'll literally loop my arm around and I'll grab my wrist and I'll just, I'll just do like that and just get nice and comfortable in the hover and I'll just get comfortable and fall asleep, especially on long, long ones, right? If I'm doing a deco. So it's definitely to your advantage as well. Um, service marker is um, when you use those lines, it gives us a nice service marker to let um, uh, people know where you're at. Now I will tell you in practical application, using a surface marker on a lake in Idaho, my opinion is it's generally a bad, bad idea. Um, I would encourage not using it if you're short, doing shore dives in Idaho to go down along the shore and come back up along the shore as well to keep out of boat traffic and keep an idea where it's at. Here's why. I can't tell you how many times I have uh, been on a dive where I've had my um, uh, marker buoy up or my my dive flag where somebody's come over, driven their boat over to it to touch and play with it to see what's going on. <laughs> It happens. <laughs> we had it. We had it happen Saturday. We had a, a dive flag out. I went out at 8 a.m. I put a dive flag on um, out at our dive site, um, and we swam out to the out to the dive flag. And as my divers came back up the uh, um, the the line and to do their service swim back out, they were within about 40 50 feet of the the um, the dive flag, and a boat came right between them. So the boat was 25 feet from the dive flag and 25 feet from the divers. It was funny. They right. went, that same uh, boat went back to the, the uh, marina and complained to the rangers that um, there was people swimming in the water, not paying attention, and there was no way to see what was going on. So they sent rangers over and said, hey, if you're going to dive here, you have to run a dive flag. And so I pointed out in the, in the, uh, the lake, and I says, you mean that big red thing out there with the, with the white stripe through it? They're like, oh, you are flying a dive flag. So it was kind of funny. Um, that's, I don't do that's horrible and funny, but horrible. Oh, it's it's more common than you realize. Yeah, it's very common. So it's just one of the things to be aware of. Um, surface markers can be relatively dangerous. Um, other things you want to do is when you go diving, uh, you want to make sure you know uh, where the ocean is. If there's an accident, and I've got to get first aid because the first aid for most dive accidents um, is oxygen. Is auction. So where's the auction? So as soon as I get on a boat, the first thing I ask the, the boat captain is, where's your auction supply? I would like to see it. Um, there was a, recently an accident. This is a few months ago. I was reading about they had a, a, D, a case of DCS on a boat. They went to pull the auction and uh, where the auction should have been was in a box with a lock on it. The lock was rusted shut. And nobody knew where the, uh, the, the key was to lock anyway. So it really didn't matter. Oh my. So it definitely does happen. Now, good news for you guys for tomorrow's dive. Um, I dive drive a, a, a three-quarter ton Dodge pickup in the backseat of my Dodge pickup. Um, there will be an EMT bag that's so, I don't know, it's three feet across. It's good size, you know, um, and uh, it's, it looks like an EMT bag. In that EMT bag, you will find um, there will be two bottles of oxygen, two regulators, two full masks um, as well, ready to go. Um, I've checked my auction. Uh, their both tanks are full, so I have enough for two divers for an uh, hour each, or one diver for two hours. So um, I keep that. I also have uh, sutures, uh, staplers, uh, glue, bandages, everything you might need, uh, cardiac event kits, um, everything. I do have an AED kit coming. And we're just, we've been having a hard time getting one, but uh, so that's all in the back of my truck. But I want I want to know where you need an AED. We're, we've ordered my wife and I. This will be the second AED we've ordered. The last one we waited for five months and it never came, so we canceled our order. And we just ordered a, a different one, um, and we just found out that it's on. It's now on back order, um, so we're trying to get an AED, but we're having kind of some bad luck on that. Um, hopefully, here soon we'll have our own AED. But but uh, that's things to know. You know, we're 
where that stuff comes from. So what about and first aid kits? So we keep all that. Other thing, as we start doing these deep dive kits, we want to know about our deep dives. We want to know where radio communications are. If there is an accident, how do we communicate with the people who can provide additional assistance and support? In our case, it'll be just a cell phone, right? We'll be able to go, go up to the top, um, dial 911 and, and uh, start ta uh, tracking you to the chamber in Idaho Falls, which is roughly 25 minutes from our site. Um, but I, I'll have auction to be able to get you on there and we can talk to that. But when you're on the boat, you want to know things like, how do I communicate with whom and whom do I communicate with? What is the local harbor channel and what's the Coast Guard channel? So you want to talk to them about that kind of stuff and know what that is. And then finally, before you even begin on this kind of stuff, you want to know what your accident management plan is. If this happens, what do we do? What's our plan? Um, do we do a diver recall? We, we were doing a dive in Hawaii, my wife and I, uh, on this boat with a fairly young uh, dive master. We just went to this basic, uh, just a nice little harbor. We're doing a 70 foot dive on a reef and uh, um, just anchor line down. And I'd gone down and I was checking out a reef and all of a sudden I heard the recall symbol and I saw one of the divers um, come up to me and they were doing this at me. And I'm like, hmm, okay. And I could hear the recall. So I was, I was like 10 minutes in the dive. So I started my ascent, got on the dive boat. The dive guide had made the brilliant decision to put his hand on a rock right in front of a dragon eel. The dragon eel reached out and uh, let him know that it was not impressed about having his space invaded. Um, so the dive addict was on the boat. He had he ended up going getting four or five stitches. Honestly, he was kind of a baby about it, to be honest. With you. But that's just that's just my own personal opinion. Uh, for the next twenty minutes, he was like, "Oh, you thought the guy was dying, man?" I was like, "Man, throw some super glue on it. Let's go diving, man." Um, <laughs> but but uh, you know, I lick the wound and clean and call it good, man. But anyway. Uh, his, their dive plan was get on the boat, get control the breeding, um, head back to shore, get him to an ambulance, and replace the dive guide. But what is the plan? Back to the to their base, and, and then they got, got that back. But what's the plan? What happens? What do you do if? And that's what you always have to think about is what if? What if this happens? What if that happens? And that's a lot of the key to diving, and especially um, when you start talking about deep diving is, making those plans ahead of time so that you know um, what you're doing and what to do if this happens. So as we start uh, into the deep dive limits, um, you guys are currently certified at 60 feet. But the good news is, is we're going to take you and I'm going to give you some experience past 60 feet to 100 feet. So our dive plan tomorrow is we're going to do a 60 foot plus, we're going to do an 80 foot plus, and we're going to do a 100 foot plus. Okay. Now, Here's the catch. I don't, uh, the only time I'd ever like to see you guys ever, 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 ever do a reverse profile like we're going to do tomorrow is with a dive professional that's highly trained um, and understands what we're doing. Here's why. We're going to do a reverse profile. So we're going to go 60, 80, 100 instead of 100. 80, 60. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. Like, like they taught us. In the, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> in the training videos. Yes, and now, now I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah. so the, the, the challenge with that is, is you're really kind of confusing the computer, and it's not the best way to do diving. You always want to do your deepest first and then go shallower. Um, there is some, uh, some later uh, information out there that says it is okay to do them as long as they're within 20 minutes of the previous or 20 feet of the previous dive and you do a sufficient surface interval. So we'll be doing a surface interval on every dive to make sure that you guys are safe and happy and, and good to go. But we're also going to stay within 20 feet of our previous dive to make sure you guys are uh, completely safe as well. So that's how we're getting away with it. Um, but your deep diving limits are going to be um, for normal diving, zero to 60 feet. When we start getting in the 60 to hundred feet. We need to start adding a level, an additional level of caution uh, because things um, start creeping in and you cannot do as easy as sit to the surface. Our second level of diving is going to be between 100 to 130 feet. Um, our final dive was going to be just past 100 feet. Um, good news is I'm going to give you guys some, uh, the lightest amount of skills at the 100 feet, um, but we're, there's going to be some skills to be done at each level. But we need to be aware that um, with each level, you want to kind of think about this as uh, green, yellow, red once you get into the red zone you definitely need to make sure you you keep your head on a swivel as they would say and that we're definitely more concerned about what's going on around us in preparation as we go deeper so 
one of the things we want to make sure we're, we're taking into account is surface air consumption. This is huge. I cannot stress uh, surface air consumption enough um, mm -hmm. in our planning stru structure of this. And here's why is that um, I just had this happen. I, I did a deep dive class and uh, we were out for 10 minutes at our deepest point. Um, and uh, I could, luckily I could, uh, we planned our dive and, uh, we're diving our plan. Um, but unfortunately the surface air consumption rate of one of the divers was a much higher than, um, uh, I would have ever anticipated. So we're keeping a good, you know, good eye on that as well. <laughs> uh, we got to the point at, at 10 minutes at 105 feet, um, that he'd burned through 80% of his gas and he was at the, at the thousand pound mark at 105, uh, 105 feet. So we called it, we wow. started he heading up. He burned his gas fast, right? So we, we kept that up. But as we go through this process, it's a good idea to make sure we're taking into account and always uh, measuring our surface air consumption rates so we know. Now, the good news is, is I'm going to give you guys a few different ways to calculate your surface air consumption rate. But in the end, the most accurate is going to be through experience, through constantly using your dive log, calculating out the beginning surface consumption rate, the, or the beginning uh, gas uh, in your tank and the ending gas in your tank, and then dividing by time um, and utilizing average depth to, to calculate that out. And then making some notes of this was a hard dive. This was a heavy current dive. This was a stressful dive. I was scared. I was happy. I was, I was nervous. I was woeful, whatever, you know, put that in there. So you get the idea of what physical and mental factors were in effect. Now, some of the factors that you guys need to be aware of in figuring out your surface air consumption are going to be the physical size of the diver. My wife is a, uh, probably half my size. Uh, she's a cute little five, um, 145 pounds and uh, of absolutely amazing and far better than I deserve. But because she's smaller than me, she has smaller lungs. So she goes through less air than I do. Um, I, she, I used to beat her all the time, but now she beats me three out of four times. I'm okay with it. I get it. Um, I work hard to try and keep up with her, but at some point she, she beats me, right? Other things to be aware of in terms of understanding um, sac rate are going to be phys, uh, fitness of the diver. When I was running a lot, when I was running marathons, my, my sac rate was stupid low and I could, I could kick her butt all day long, but I haven't run in about two years. Uh, I'm going to start running again, but the fitness level. So if you're completely out of shape, um, you're definitely going to have a different consumption rate than if you are in shape. One of the things most people don't realize is a 50 to 60 minute dive at 60 feet is equal to a brisk five to seven mile walk. Oh, wow. And I mean a brisk. So it's one of the reasons that 58% of dive maladies are, ba uh, are cardiac related. 58%. It's a huge number. That's from Dan. That's not from me. Um, so fitness of the diver is definitely a key factor to be aware of. And so if you're, um, what we, the problem is, is, we get a lot of couch potatoes and uh, office warrior, uh, armchair warriors um, that, you know, they, they're, they're my age or, you know, I'm, I'm like the typical diver, 50 years old, white guy, uh, office job. I, I sit behind a, a computer and I am a, a keyboard commando. Right. Uh, and that's what I do all day long. So I, I don't do a lot of, a lot of much, right. I've got to force myself to go for a walk. And then all of a sudden I, I get this wild hair that I'm going to go diving in Curacao or, you know, Cozumel or wherever the hell I'm going. Right. And all of a sudden I've, I've not done anything for, you know, 11 months and, and uh, three weeks. And all of a sudden I decide I'm going to go do three days in Curacao. So all of a sudden I, I'm going to go, I'm going to go walk five to seven miles three times briskly um, and think that everything's going to be fine. Right. So be aware, you know, if, if you're not in great physical shape, less dives is definitely to your advantage. You'll have a lot more enjoyment of those dives and you'll have a better experience overall. Um, other things that um, affect um, surface air consumption that to be aware of is the experience level of the diver. Um, my divers that I did the other day on their deep dive, um, one of them was fairly inexperienced. And because of that, um, he definitely was going through more gas than he needed to, right? And so on the same size tank between the three divers I took out, um, I did all three dives on the same tank. They went through three tanks. Oh, wow. I've got a lot more experience. Than I do this. So I'm extremely comfortable in the water, but that's because I do this a lot, right? I, so the experience level of the diver doing dives, if you do it a lot, you're going to get comfortable and you're going to relax. Uh, stress level. Um, I would encourage you guys, um, 
uh, David, um, tomorrow morning, get up and buy your wife some flowers and uh, her favorite and make her her favorite breakfast um, and uh, tell her how amazing and beautiful she is and, and fantastic. And, Gail, make sure you appreciate that as well, because stress definitely takes a toll on diving. If you guys could come to come to uh, my dive site tomorrow uh, for this class and you guys are like in total Zen and, and, and lovey dovey mode that you're, you know, better than the day you got married, you know, your dive will be much better. So what we call it, Nikki and I, we call it lake time. I don't do anything in a hurry. I don't do anything fast. We take our time. And in fact, it, on Saturday, it was funny. We did a dive along in Yellowstone and people said, what time do you get a dive? I says, well, when I get my gear on, I'm going to get in the water. They says, what is that going to be? I says, when I get my gear on, I'll, I'll be in the water. That, and when I get in the water is when I'm going to start diving. <laughs> and they're like, don't you have a time frame? I says, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 minutes, somewhere around there. I'll, I'm just not like I'm trying to jump off a boat and I'm, as a Navy SEAL or something. I mean, it's not like I'm, I'm trying to kill Obama here or, or Osama here, right? Um, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> take your freaking time, right? So stress level is a big thing. Take your time and relax. One of the things we're going to do is when we um, we get out and we do our first weight check, uh, after we've got our weight check and I know that we're going to sink and we're going to get out there and everything's going to be fine, I'm going to stop you guys. And you're going to see me do my Zen symbol. I, uh, I'm famous for my Zen symbol. I'm going to move over here so I'm a little more centered. But you see me do this. I'm asking you to do three things. The first one is going to be get your mind right. Relax. We're on lake time. Whatever happened this mor that morning, that uh, the day before, or is going to happen at work on Monday, it don't matter. Right? We're going to relax. We're going to focus on right now. Benjamin's got you. There's no sea monsters in Ryrie. Everything's good to go. Um, mm -hmm. If something happens, I'm prepared. No big deal. Good. Relax your mind. The second thing I want you guys to do is relax your breathing. Get that good mindful breathing. Clear yourself out. Get all the nasty air out, all the good air in. Nice it's yoga breathing. Good. Absolutely. The last thing I want you to do as part of this is I want to get your body right. And so what, what I want you to do is literally just go, just shake your muscles out. It's, it's kind of fun to do too, right? Just shake it out and get, get nice and relaxed. So I'm going to stop you. Zen. Get your mind right. Get your breathing right. Get your body right. Everything's good to go. Once we begin our descent, uh, when we descend at about 10 or 15 feet, uh, I'm going to stop you again. You'll see me give you the Zen symbol. I want you the exact same thing. Get your mind right, get your breathing right, get your body right, and then we're going to take off. I want you guys to be as relaxed as possible. Let's get all that uh, stress out of the way. Now, the next thing that affects deep diving is going to be um, your breathing patterns. Now, one of the things, David, I hate to tell you, but you're breathing wrong. Nobody's ever told you that, have they? Has anybody ever told you you're breathing wrong? I thought well, I was in it. <laughs> so, Gail... Have you ever seen a baby breathe? Yeah. How does a baby breathe? Uh, from their chest or from their tummy? Yeah, usually from their tummy. Absolutely. It's called diaphragmic breathing. We as adults have taught ourselves to breathe wrong. So one of the things I want you guys to, to realize is 60% of the oxygenization for your body comes from the bottom 33% of your lungs. So here's how we're going to breathe. It's going to be even. It's going to be comfortable. And it's not going to be all the way in, all the way out. It's going to be normal breaths. But I want you to breathe in through your belly first, in through your chest second, and out from your chest first, and out from your belly second. If you do that rhythmically and evenly, and remember, if your balloon is 100%, zero being completely empty, 100% being completely full, you're only going to breathe in 30 uh, down to 30% and into 70%, right? So you're going to stay in that kind of middle zone comfortably mm -hmm. while you're breathing now, but do it from your tummy first. <laughs> okay. And if you do it evenly from your tummy first, never skipping breaths, you'll oxygenate your body a lot better and you'll actually go through substantially less gas. Make sense? Good to me. Yeah, that does make sense. Absolutely. The thing I want you guys to realize is, um, so Gail, if I gave you a, 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 a scooter, um, to go shop at Walmart, um, or I gave you a 75-pound ba grocery basket and told you to run around the track at IF High School, where would you use more air? Uh, the high school? <laughs> Absolutely. So realize that the amount of workload that you're doing will affect your breathing patterns as well. 
So the heavier you have to do things, the more you're trying to do stuff, the heavier you're going to breathe. So as we kind of figure out what our sack rate is and start planning for that, we always want to make sure we kind of plan how intense is the dive we're going to do. So we start thinking, okay, I'm going to be in a heavy current. Am I going to be working with the current or am I going to be working against the current? Like, for example, when I, I like to go river diving um, with the sturgeon out under John's Hole. It's, it's a really, really cool dive site. Um, it's definitely a, a big kid dive site. you got to put your big kid pants on to do it and have the big kid experience. But very cool dive. But it's, it's, a, it's a rough current getting down to 70 feet. And it's, it's uh, zero visibility. You can, you can only see your computer if you can put it within four inches of your face until you get to 70 feet. So realize that things that you're going to be doing during your dive will definitely cost you gas as you go through that. So the workload. Other things that are definitely going to take into account, temperature of the water. As, as uh, things get colder, the water gets, the air gets more dense and you use more of it because of that. But your body is going to be working harder. Your heart's going to be beating faster trying to keep your body warm. Okay? Use more oxygen. Uh, Say again? And you'll be using more oxygen. Absolutely. Do. More air, more accurately. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me turn that down just a little bit. I have a fan going on me. Um, so you'll use more air through that process. Um, other things to be aware of, depth of the dive. David, why do you think depth of the dive is going to go cause you to go through more air? Because every lungful actually has greater density when you go deeper. And ding, so ding, ding. when you... When you go deeper, Pressure. you're actually breathing twice as much air if you're at 33 feet. Absolutely. Here, let me. I happen to have a really cool um, visual aid for you guys. So, yes, this is a sponge out of out of the kitchen that I cut up, and uh, yes, I had to go to the store and replace it with for my wife. Um, but <laughs> it gives a good example of if this was one air molecule, um, which would be 21 percent oxygen, 79 percent nitrogen, right? So that's what it would look at the, like at the surface. Well, as we go down, it compresses. And what you end up getting is in the same amount of space, now two molecules of air. As we go down to 30, 66 feet, now we're three times as dense, but we have three times as much gas in the same amount of space. And as we go down to 99 feet, now we have four times the amount of gas in, one, in the same amount of space. So if we think about that, we have a 100 cubic foot tank because it's, it's nice and easy to, or 80 cubic foot tank, that's it's fine. We go down to 33 feet, it's literally half of that. So it's, a, it's the equivalent of having 40 cubic foot of air instead of 80 cubic feet of air. If we go to 66 feet, now it's one third of that. If we go to 99 feet, it's one quarter. So that 80 cubic feet is now equal to 20 cubic feet of air. So you can see really quickly, as we compress that in, we will go through more gas just through the pure density of the gas. Simple enough. Now, other things to be aware of, in, and this goes back to kind of the idea of understanding and making sure that your ga the gas that you're, uh, or the equipment you're using is well serviced. Um, gas loss due to leaks in, in cylinder valves and gauges and regulators is very common. Um, they have little bubblers. I just had this happen. Um, uh, we were in Hawaii. We are uh, <laughs> diving along and uh we popped in a, a site and uh, my left tank because I, I dive two tanks in side mount my left tank started bubbling and I, I noticed it was bubbling along and so luckily because it was side mount i just turned it off and i just i i dove completely on my right cylinder until i was ready and then i switched over my left cylinder and i burned the gas off in that so i only got a two and a half hour dive out of two tanks uh, on that dive but you know that's a very common it definitely affects your um uh, your uh, gas consumption as well um, gas required to equalize and maintain buoyancy in the inflator. One of the things that a lot of divers have a challenge with is getting correctly weighted. Now, the correctly, correct weighting can affect you in two ways. If you're overly weighted, you're carrying more crap with you. It goes back to that kind of pushing the, the 75 pound uh, uh, shopping cart around the, uh, around the track, right? Takes more, mm -hmm. uh, more air to do that, right? More air, uh, more challenge. But if we're heavily weighted as well, it's going to cause us to use more gas in our BC. So every time you push that magic little white button or a little black button on your BC, you're using gas that you should be breathing. So it's one of the mm -hmm. things we want to make sure that when we're um, diving, that we're keeping ourselves as close to neutral as possible. Now, definitely be aware of if you're diving an 80 cubic foot aluminum cylinder, 
it'll start out about two pounds negative and it'll end four pounds positive. So that's about a six pound shift. So at the beginning of any dive, you have 3,000 pounds in your 80 foot cubic foot tank. You should be about three to four pounds heavy. Not a lot. That's, that is, I mean, that's my little bean bag right here, right? Um, it's not a lot, but it's still, it's still something. But I don't want to make, I want to make sure that I'm not more than that. Because if I'm more than that, then I'm carrying extra crap. And, and I always like to say poop before you dive because nobody likes to swim with extra crap. But, come on, that was, <laughs> that was funny. <laughs> you like those little jokes I throw out? So, yeah, yeah, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so make sure you, you, you don't carry an extra crap with you because it's just not fun. So we want to make sure we get to that even weighting. We want to start out slightly heavy so that at the end of the dive, when we're at 700 PSI, we're trying to hold that good safety stop that we're not going holding on, grabbing a rock to make. I've done that, by the way, holding on to a rock, trying to stay down. So just uh, definitely be aware of that. Now, be aware as well that your sack rate is going to change based upon cylinders. So I'm going to teach you guys tonight a way to figure out your sack rate based upon you. And in you guys learn a little metric today. I'm sorry. Um, but metric is so much better than that weird imperial stuff because, I mean, there are only two countries in the world that use imperial anyway, right? Maybe three. Um, so we're going to... I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly. So we're going we're to learn a little metric today. Um, so that you don't, you'll never have to worry about cylinder size and your sack rate again. I know for me that my sack rate is nine liters per minute. That has nothing to do with the cylinder size. It has nothing to do with anything else. It has only to do with the amount of gas that I actually use. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more in depth because sack rate is definitely to your advantage. Now, SSI in your booklet gave you this as your sack rate. Yep. It's, it's confusing as hell. Would you like a little bit easier way to figure out your sack rate? Yes, please. Absolutely. <laughs> so here's my first problem with this is they want you to do your sack rate calculation at depth. So let's talk about that for a minute. If we're doing sack rate calculation, what is, let's start with what does sack rate stand for? Surface air consumption mm -hmm. rate. Absolutely. So the, it almost asks, begs the question of what color was Custer's yeah. white horse? Why are they doing it at depth? <laughs> ding, 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 ding. You got it exactly. So that's exactly <laughs> correct. Why would you figure out your surface air consumption rate at depth? Because the problem is, David, you've done a couple dives. Have you ever had two dives that were exactly alike? I mean, exactly to the second alike. Never, ever, ever. Absolutely. Nope. I've, I've run tons of marathons that I've never, I've never finished this, a mm. marathon um, the same exact time as a previous marathon. Ever. I've been yeah. in the same place several times and never had it be the same. Exactly. So that's my biggest problem is if, um, in stats, and, and I, I live in a statistics world, uh, the problem is, is we have an old phrase that says junk in, junk out. If you start with crap data, you're going to get crap results. You yeah. start with accurate data, we start with accurate results. So let's, let's do this a little differently. Uh, let's do some basic ideas of how to do this the right way. So the first thing I want you guys to do is you got a little pen of, pa pen of paper here. Oh. We'll get one real quick. Perfect. I want you to write a few things down for me because I'm going to go through this orally because I don't think I actually have it in this presentation. I thought I did. Let's see. I want to say six. six, six. I'm curious. You say you're in statistics. What do you do? Um, I'm actually a consultant. I'm a marketing development consultant. Um, I specialize in the automotive and uh, motorsport industries. Cool. So I'm an I'm an engineer, so. <laughs> there you go. So you'll like accurate data. Unfortunately, I, I need to put this this in the slide. So we're going to do this orally, um, and we're going to figure this out together. So there's first one we're going to figure out is how we figure out sac rate. It's going to be super easy, and it's a little it's a lot of fun. And you guys are going to get to figure out your sac rate tomorrow night. You're gonna and you're gonna have fun. And and here's my only request: make me a deal, Dave and Gail. Um, if, when I teach you how to figure out your sack rate, will you please take a picture of yourselves figuring your sack rate out and send it to me? Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. First thing you want to do is you're <laughs> going to um, find, you guys have Netflix or uh, Amazon or? Yeah. Okay, perfect. What's your favorite comedy? Uh, hmm. oh, okay. I mean, well, I guess like if there's 
like Big Bang or something like that, a half hour comedy show. Yeah, Big Bang, that's a good one. Big Bang, perfect. So I want you guys to find your favorite episode of Big Bang Theory uh, for tomorrow night after we, and I want you guys, you guys, your oh. homework is to watch an episode of Big Bang. This is rough, right? The second thing I want you to do is I want you to take your cylinder, one of the cylinders that we dive tomorrow, and I, all you got to do is I want you to put. Oh, hold on. We had a major ink, ink pen explosion. Oh, no. <laughs> she's she's got, got a hand it. covered in ink. Oh, crap. That stinks. <laughs> Luckily, it wasn't a red pen. Otherwise, it would have looked the shoes bleeding all over. And here you go. So I, I gave I gave my wife a freeze dried eagle today. She didn't like it. I don't know why it came back to my office. <laughs> so, in case you wonder what we're doing at our house today, we're I'm giving my wife freeze dried eagles. Apparently, what eagles? Eagle. Yep, it's a such animal. <laughs> freeze dried eagle. <laughs> Never thought of freeze drying an eagle. It's actually just vacuum sealed, but oh, I got it. Okay. Yeah, I was at a trade show and they were giving those out, and I was like, "Oh, it looks cool." They they want to give me one out of the package. I was like, "It's much cooler the package, <laughs> right?" I got, I'll take the package. I got ink all over my hand. <laughs> oh man! <laughs> oh, okay? Sorry. Yep. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So step one: find your favorite uh, your favorite TV show. Step two: I want you to take you both to take a cylinder and put a regulator reg set on it. Okay. And you want us to breathe the whole time? Yeah, I want you to put your mask on. I want you to for, first record the beginning PSI. Okay. So uh, once you record the begin beginning PSI. Yep, record the beginning PSI. And then I want you to time it. Um, use some sort of timing device to time out how long you, you breathe on it from the beginning you when you put it in your mouth. And I want you to put your mask on because it's much better with you put your mask on as well. Uh, okay. And uh, after, at the end of this show, I want you to record the ending PSI and the time. Okay, beginning PSI and the ending PSI and the time. And beginning Correct. And the of time. Okay. Okay. All That's right. Hard. <laughs> we, so, are we doing that tonight? Tomorrow. After I want you guys to do it on empty tanks. Oh, so if you, yeah. When when oh. the air isn't needed anymore. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. You won't have. You won't go through a ton of gas with this. Um, let's see. I'm going to go over to a different presentation real quick so I can have this out. I mean, I could use my own tanks that are mostly empty. Yeah, that'd be perfect. So once you do this, um, we're going to need a couple pieces of information to make this accurate. Now, if you are only ever going to use 80 cubic foot cylinders, all you, okay. you could. You can you can use this. Uh, you can divide out psi divided by the number of minutes, and you'll get a, 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 a psi per minute. But I'd like to teach you guys to do this in metric, if that would be okay. Okay. And I'm pulling up a worksheet because I thought I had this in this presentation, and I don't. I think I'm using an older version of my presentation, which bugs me. So I apologize. Let's see. Give me a second here. Da, 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 da. I have it another one. I just don't want to have. I'm lazy. Don't want to have to go open up a different presentation. Um, let's see, because then I'll have to find it in the presentation. So, uh, and like six. There we go. Okay. So we're gonna share our presentation. Uh, stop that screen and present a share screen over to a window. There we go. All right. So. Here we go. So we're going to start over here. Nice big numbers. So if we know that we're diving an 80 cubic foot uh, cubic foot tank, cubic, cubic feet, there we go. We know that that is an 11.1 liter cylinder. Oh, okay. I've heard that there were 12, but I'll take 11.1. Absolutely. Most of them are 11.1. Uh, if you ever need, I happen to have a cool spreadsheet. Take me just a second to get over to it that I use quite a bit and tank data. And so I have every tank known to man. The, oh, wow. uh, the typical uh, uh, Catalina S80 is 11.1 liters at 3000 PSI. Awesome. Um, so, so now we also know that if we fill it up to 3000 PSI, we need to be able to convert that over to bar. 
PS sign. Right. So there's a simple way to do that, 0 0.06894. We utilize 3,000 times 0 0.06894. If we multiply those across, I'm going to put a little multiplication symbol there. That equals, oops, sorry, that's supposed to be an equal sign. That, work with me here, uh, equals 206.82. Bar. With me so far? I'm gonna yeah. make this a touch smaller so I can get more stuff on one screen. I got a little little jiggy with it when I was uh, making the the font size. We'll take that down to 60. So now if I want to know how many liters are in this tank, I simply take 206.82 bar and I multiply it by 11.1 .1 times 11.1 .1 equals 2,295 bar. I'm going to round down because it's 2,295.7. Uh, so this tank has 2,295 liters of gas. That's, what, that's how we do this. Now, simply enough, I know, uh, based upon this information, that if I start off with, and I, I breathe, I start off with, we'll say 2000 PSI is at the beginning of the time. And I, I breathe out a thousand PSI of gas equals one. We'll make this a little bit more realistic. How about that? I breathe out 50 to 1500 PSI equals 500 PSI used. That's during my, uh, during my big bang, right? Right. All I need to do is I need to take 500, multiply that by 0.06894. Six eight nine four equals so five hundred times point oh six eight nine four equals thirty four point four seven bar. Now, last but not least, here's where it gets it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Is I'm going to take that thirty four point four seven bar, and I'm going to uh, multiply that by my 11.1 .1 equals 11.1 means I breathe 382 liters of gas. Now all I need to do is take that 382, divide it by my 20 minutes, divide it by 20, and my stack rate is 19 liters, liters Per minute. This is a little bit more complicated overall, but as long as I know the size of my tank and I can divide it by by this, I'll know how many liters I'm actually using. Here's the good news. Nine point one. Yeah, I. I Your real one is that liters? My, yeah, my my actual sack rate is around. Um, I've gotten as low as six, uh, but uh, typically I'm I'm closer to nine liters per minute. Is pretty typical okay. for me. Oh wow! Okay. So I I just used some some rough math here real quick. But here's the thing: my that's my surface air consumption rate at the surface. Doesn't matter what cylinder I use. That's my actual surface air consumption rate. No matter what I do. Okay. Here's and that's that's where it really gets slick. Is um, now all I need to do is I need to say okay, my sac rate is sac is 19 liters per minute. Here's where it gets really awesome, in my opinion, at least. I, all I need to do is say, okay, I want to go out and I want to do a 66-foot dive. So my dive is going to be 66 feet, um, which equals out how many atmospheres is that, David? Three. Two plus one, yeah. Two plus one, yeah. Exactly. Equals three ATA. Okay? So all I need to do is say, if I'm going to do a 66-foot dive... I need to multiply three atmospheres times 19 liters per minute. Mm -hmm. Three times 19 equals my sac rate at depth will be 57 liters per minute. Simple enough. If I was going to dive at um, 99 feet, that'd be four. So it'd be four times 19 equals. 76 liters per minute. There's only so, one more. 
Yes, ma'am. Oh, I was just going to say the reason why they have us do it at depth is that because it it gives you like more of a buffer. No, uh, it's going to give you how fast you're going to use your tank at that depth. The reason they have you do it at depth is it's a simpler way that uh, covers more people and more people are able to understand. You guys are pretty smart, so I wanted to give you the, the actual way to do it that's more okay. accurate. Now, there's one more piece of uh, data that I need to, to take into account. I've taken into account depth, but I've missed another key piece of information. David, what, what did I miss in figuring out my sack rate? So, okay. Um, think about the shopping. Think. Oh, yeah. We're resting. I was thinking of that the whole time. I was like, so should we do another one where we're doing mild ac activity? mild okay. exercise so here's where we take we we already know what our sack rated resting at depth is if we add in effort so liters liters per minute an easy dive will be one about 1.5 so the dive we're going to be doing tomorrow i would expect a, a factor of 1.5 for our additional sack rate um now this is an arbitrary number that we all determine is going to be about right if i'm going to do a hard drift dive i might take that up to three if i'm in a dry suit it's super cold and uh, I, I need uh, something more, I may take that up. But for tomorrow's dive, I would expect a 1.5 uh, multiple on our sack rate. So times 1.5 equals 100. Whoop. Ooh, that's a big sack rate. <laughs> 100, I can't type it. 114 liters per minute. So, <clears throat> so okay. if this was what we could determine for our sack rate, we would know that uh, we would need 114 liters per minute to do a 99 foot dive. Now, simply enough, we know we up here earlier, um, we put together, we figured out that our total amount of gas, we have 2,295 liters of gas. So easy enough to figure out, can we do this dive? Or how long can we do this dive? Well, the first thing is, is we want to divide it by three. So we're gonna, do, we're gonna use two thirds of this gas, right? 2295 times 0. 0.66 times 0. 0.66. That's our uh, usable gas. Equals 1,514 liters. Liters of usable gas. That gives us a safety margin. Okay. Right. right. Of about 700 liters of gas. Now, all we need to do is say, okay, how long can I do this time? 114 divided by 1514. The other way around. Yep. 114. Thank you very much. 115. Sorry, 1514 divided by thank you very much. I always do that in reverse, to be honest with you. Thank I was doing it correctly. Right. Right. Equals <laughs> out. At this sack rate means you can do a 13 minute dive. 13 minutes at depth. At depth. I always, always think of Charlie in the Chocolate Factory where he says, nope, stop that, reverse it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Because I do that all the time. <laughs> yep, that's exactly, you're exactly right. So if my sack rate were 19 liters per minute, um, this is how long I could stay at 99 feet. I could do a 13-minute dive. Okay. That's how we do it. It's really not that complicated. The keys to remember are the size of the tank, and 0. 0.06894, that's your conversion for PSI to bar. If you do those two things. Is that like a number that they figured out? Yeah, it's, that's, it's actually it's a conversion factor. Oh. Yeah, it's a conversion factor. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's, the most, that's the most common. But you can remember 0. 0.8694 or 0. 0.69. Um, mm -hmm. I know a yeah. lot of people use 0. 0.69. Mm -hmm. I just, I like to be a little bit more accurate. So I use 0. 0.06. 0.06894. Um, you can actually take it out a little farther if you wanted to. It just doesn't, it's not worth it. But that's how you basically do that. You know me too well already. <laughs> so, copy. Cool. So, what I'm going to do for you guys is I just texted you all that math. Everything I just did, I just texted it to you. Nice. But then, that's how you figure it out. Um, nice. So, the first thing is I want you guys to do is 
Simply enough, mark the beginning and end of, of your gas usage. And please take a picture of it while you do it and send it to me so I can post it on Facebook. Because it is just fun, hilarious to have a picture of you guys with a, with your uh, mask on and your regular right mouth watching Big Bang. So, and Big Bang's about the least stressful show I can come up with. And it's my personal favorite as well. So, um, that's, that's what I would suggest. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. So, that's how we do it. Um, and that's going to be your absolute most accurate way of doing it. Now, for you guys, I would like you to do all your dive planning um, based upon an, a 19 liters per minute sack rate, if you wouldn't mind, please. Um, so I want you guys to do a, um, tonight before you guys come out tomorrow. I'd like to know what your total time at depth will be for 60 feet, 80 feet and 100 feet, please. Okay, so total time and depth, right? Yeah. Total time that you can spend at depth at 60 feet, 80 feet, mm -hmm. and 100 feet. Okay. Based on a 19 liters per minute sack rate. 19 liters per minute sack rate. Got it. That should be reasonably accurate for you guys. That's. Um, I know it sounds like a lot, but um, it's uh, for most divers, that's actually not too far off. Okay. So um, as you get better and as time goes by, that, that will get better. And we'll do our dive planning based upon that. Um, I've already got it figured out, but I need you guys to figure it out because I know how to do it. So right. easy enough. That's Sounds what good. I want you guys to do. And then uh, um, we'll do our dive planning based upon that um, so that you guys understand and uh, are good to go. And we, you want it in leaders, right? Yes, please. I, I want you to, uh, I want to know how long you guys can stay at depth. Oh, yeah. Depth and time. Yeah. Yep. Got now, okay. when you start getting a little farther along and you happen to be um, an Excel nerd, then you start doing stupid stuff like this. And this is, <laughs> this is my gas planning worksheet that I use. My um, nerd. <laughs> oh, my God. You have no idea how big a nerd. <laughs> what you guys can't see right now is I have a 34 inch screen here. A 34 screen inch screen here. I, let me kick back over oh, to my. Honey. I can tell by how much you're turning your head that your screens are pretty nice. I was I've thinking, got, I need to set up like that. Well, I've got a 34 here, a 34 here, a 34 there, and then I have my laptop over there. So I've got four screens going, and then I have the pro mic up here and a, uh, a, a thing in the middle. So yeah, <laughs> kind of a nerd. <laughs> and, I, and yes, I've, I've got a. Uh, uh, 22 version of the MacBook Pro um, as well, the top of the line with everything that you can get. So, yes, super nerd. It's okay. <laughs> but, um, and one of the dives I'm doing, just so you guys are aware, tomorrow is uh, I'm going to go out and do a dive at ADM, a deco dive with twin sets. Um, I'm going to put my, my four computers. I've got a, a Sunto Black, an Apex DSX, um, a Shearwater uh, Perdix, and a Garmin Mark II. Um, R2i. Um, I've got all four of those computers. I'm going to put them on a, a PVC, PVC with a with a GoPro, and I'm going to video them through a dive tomorrow. So tomorrow morning. So that's one of my fun dives. So yes, so super nerd. Making sure they're all calibrated the same. Yep. Uh, well, it's not that I'm looking for calibration. I'm doing a uh, head to head test and see which one we like the best. I did it okay. once with a uh, with just three computers, but uh, um, Suto just sent me a new computer. They want uh, they want me to start pushing and and uh, liking. So I'm going to uh, um, do it with their with their new computer that they they say is the greatest thing since sliced bread. So we'll see if it uh, slices bread. With somebody? Say again. Do that with somebody. Are you with doing what? it with somebody? Nope. I'm just going to go out and do a solo dive. Okay. So I'll, I'm just going to. It's a super easy dive. I'm going to do two tanks on my back, and uh, I'll do uh, I'll go out and spend about a half hour. Um, I'll go out to probably 125 feet, and uh, slowly come back. So. Oh, okay. So, nice easy dive, and then uh, I'll do that from eight to eight thirty, and then from nine to eleven ish, I'll be on an open water class. So. Oh, no. okay. And then I'll see you guys tomorrow at noon, I believe, noon or eleven thirty. I can't remember. You said eleven thirty, so. Eleven thirty. Yep. I'll I'll be in the water um, already, and then I'll I'll be um, doing your class, and I'll be uh, semi monitoring a couple other students with a couple of my assistant instructors uh, as well. So um, I'll just kind of be kind of keeping a, a uh, my third eye on them to make sure that they're good to go but we'll get that early to bring our gear down absolutely but yeah that's this is my dive planning oh, that sheet was one thing I, that was one thing i heard you had mentioned before that you like had like a wagon or or atv or something to bring gear down is that 
I, I do not. Uh, there will be uh, one of the dads there tomorrow that has a, a ranger, but um, I don't, I wouldn't count on that. So, okay. Um, I, was he, just curious. Um, I, I usually just carry the crap down the hill. So um, oh. as fun as that is. <laughs> All right. Well, let's jump back into class here real quick. I'm going to share my screen again. So other considerations during deep dive planning, why do you think environmental conditions might be important? Uh, well, if it's cold or the current is really strong or the, I mean, if it's nighttime. <laughs> Absolutely. You environmental know, conditions. Time, you're going to be really dark anyway, but yeah. Absolutely. Um, other things to be aware of is communication. So you guys are going to see a few things. Um, some of those hands arm signals I use, the first one's going to be, I need you in trim. So if you see me do this, I'm asking you to get into diver position trim. Okay. Now be aware, we're going to be going down a wall, which means if you stay in a horizontal position going down that wall, you're going to kick the, kick the soot up. So please be aware that your fins, um, if they come anywhere near the bottom, it'll soot up really fast. So we're going to make sure we stay above the, above the bottom because if you look at the, uh, the, the sand for too long, it explodes just, just because. So we want to make sure that we're aware of that. So if you see me do this, I'm asking you to get into trim. My other symbol, you'll see me do this. This means hover. We're stopping where we're at and we're hovering. Okay. Other signs you may see, see me do is I'll ask you, and this means What's where's your, your gas? Mm -hmm. okay. And I use, here's what I do is I always, I do everything one handed. One through five, six, seven, eight, nine. So if I have 2,700 pounds of gas, 2,700. 1,800. 1,700. So front of the hand for one through five, back of the hand for six through nine. Okay? Okay. So that, those will be some of the things you'll see for me as well. The other thing I'm going to ask you is you watch me. Okay? Okay, right? Simple enough. And one of the skills I'm going to ask you guys to do is going to be what do you think I'm asking for this? Upside down, uh, upside down P, um, upside down octopus. What do you think, Gail? What am I asking if I if I give you this symbol? I'm not sure. I've <laughs> never seen Launch that one yeah, before, but I'm thinking let off some gas or something. I don't know. Launch your SMB. Oh, okay. Oh. So yeah. I want to talk to you guys a little bit about how to launch your SMB. Uh, I do it differently. I do not believe in taking your, regu your regulator out of your mouth at depth. So you guys are going to have your SMB, and hopefully, I, I would like to see you guys check it tonight just to make sure, but your SMB should, if you've got a good one, I'm just going to open this up, should have a nice slit at the bottom. Does your SMB have a nice slit at the bottom? Don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. Find that out tonight. Yeah, and check that. And here's why. What I'd like you to do is when you get your SMB out and it's hooked onto, uh, onto your leader, onto your reel, I want you to simply open up this bottom, turn your head to the side, put it over the um, exhaust valve of your, your regulator, and just breathe normally. And what will happen is gas goes up. It'll go into your SMB. And when you feel it good uh, taunt and it starts to pull you to the surface, take it away, check your reel. And then bring it back and give it two more breaths. And it will start to make you rise. Once you feel it start to make you rise, go ahead and on the on your reel, let it go ahead and let it fly. You need now, to close it. Nope. It self-closes. Okay. Now, one of the things the reason we do this, there's a couple of different reasons. One, I don't want you guys taking your regulators out of your mouth if we can help it at depth. I feel okay. like that creates an additional safety hazard. But the other problem is, is if you take your regulator out of your mouth, David, what are you doing with your breathing? You're holding your breath. You're holding your breath. And if you're holding your breath, you're going to have a hard time with trim and buoyancy, right? Yeah. You're going to start rising in the water column. And I don't want that. If you're breathing normally, you're going to stay in, in, in position, right? And if and you're so holding your breath and you took a deep breath so you could prepare to blow into your SMB then yep. you'll start rising with your breath held that's and bad. that's bad, bad. Exactly. And that's not what we want to do at all. So we don't take our regulator out of our mouth. That is one of the reasons. Another reason that has actually happened to Nikki and I 
is that as you start using a secondary regulator um, or your primary regulator, you start pushing that button to purge it underneath there or you, uh, it causes the air to come out colder and you can actually cause your regulator freeze open um, mm -hmm. and it yeah, cause, sure. cause problems. So we've had that happen. We used the safety second to launch an SMB one time and it froze into the open position. So okay. that is absolutely a thing that can happen. And also just, just the, if something were to happen while you're trying to blow up that SMB or use your, your regulator to blow up that SMB, um, you now are in a compromised situation. And I, I'd prefer you guys not be in a compromised situation. Um, so keeping your regulator in your mouth, you're going to keep better trim. You're going to be safer as well. And you're going to have less problems uh, as well. So that's what I would encourage. And that's how I'd like you to do your SMB, provided you have an opening at the bottom. If you don't, I can always lend you one of mine. I'd prefer you use your own stuff because it's your stuff. And I want you to be most familiar with your stuff. I don't mind lending out an SMB. But what I do mind is you getting familiar and proficient with my SMB, not your SMB. I want you to be proficient with that on your own. So um, I will have a few of these with me. Um, I always um, carry two with me. Um, so, um, but I, I carry redundancy. So I've always got two, two reels, two spools, two knives, two computers. It's just part of ABCs of Benjamin. So um, be aware that's what I'm looking for. So that's going to be your SMB symbol. Just Breathe normally. Don't put your regulator in your mouth. Just and breathe normally. Other uh, other communication things. If I give you the this, I'm telling you to send. Obviously, level off. Get into dive. Get into trim. But if I give you guys this, what do you think I'm trying to tell you? Time to go up. We're ending the dive. That's my yeah. end the dive symbol. Okay. Uh, as we come back up the wall, I'll ask you. I'll give you this symbol right here. This is my where are you at on deco. Three minutes safety stop. So if we're into two minutes of a day safety stop, and I ask you this, you can give me two minutes. I'm asking how much deco you have. When your computer has cleared your safety stop, I want you to simply brush across your computer to tell me that you are good to go. That means you're ended your safety stop. Okay. So, and you'll see me do the same thing. I wear two computers, so you'll see me brush both. That means okay. I'm ended my safety stop. Easy okay. enough. Those are all... Those are all the simple uh, signs I'm going to give you um, for now. Um, there are other symbols and signs out there, but that's the ones I'm worried about for tomorrow. Um, let's see. I think we can skip flying and diving. I think you've got a pretty good understanding of, uh, of diving and flying. Yeah. Let's see. Pre-entry procedures. Um, one of the things we want to make sure we're doing as well is we're looking through the dive planning uh, planner or we're looking at the tables. We want to make sure we're, we're, we're planning all these dives within the NDL limit. Um, it's definitely to your uh, to your advantage to make sure um, that you're staying with that NDL limit. We also don't want to always make sure while we are responsible for ourselves, it's never a bad idea to do a pre-entry buddy check. Um, and there's going to be a couple ways to do this. Uh, my personal favorite is I play the very fun game called, and they play this in the Mormon church all the time, called head, shoulders, knees, and toes. I look at my buddy and I start with their head. Do they have a mask? Have they got a hood? Uh, work their way down. Is their straps hooked up? Is their inflator hooked up? Is their inflator working? My wife will tell you there's not a time that I don't push her inflator. If she's wearing a dry suit, I push the dry suit inflator and then I push her BC inflator. I want to see both of them work. I make sure uh, she, her weight pockets are secure and ready to go. She's got fins. Everything looks good. And I turn her around. Make sure her gas is on. Make sure her tank is secure. Uh, so head, shoulders, knees, and toes, just work your way down. It's just a nice thing to do for your buddy. And the other thing I want you guys to do is uh, when we first do our weight check, I want you to do a bubble check. As you go down, I want to see you guys go down three, four, five feet and look at each other and say, good, bubble check. So what I'll do is you bubble check. And what you're going to do is you're going to look at me and you're going to do a spin around so I can look to see that there's no bubbles. Once you've come around, I'm going to give you, okay, bubbles, <laughs> bubble check. And I'm going to do the same thing. You're going to, I'm going to spin around. You're going to look and does he have any bubbles? And if, um, if I don't, you're going to give me okay bubbles and then we're good to go. So we're going to do a quick bubble check um, as we go through this process. So we're going to make sure we do some pre-entry decisions, make sure we plan our dives and dive our plans to make sure we are as prepared as humanly possible. Let's see. Now, as we go through this, I can tell you one of the most important skills and uh, th things to practice is going to be that good trim and hover, right? Mm -hmm. Diet position and being able to stay in that good hover. Maintaining control. As we're coming back up, 
we want to make sure we're able to keep that good control. So the easiest way to do that, if you're doing a shore dive, is we're going to say, okay, we're heading up, ending dive. Good to go. And we're going to make sure we stay about three feet above the surface. But as we go up, we're going to make sure we're keeping a, a constant visu or visual as well as mental reminder that we're staying that three to four feet above the surface, coming up gently. If we, if we start to see ourselves rise above that, we're going to make sure to control our gas. We're going to make sure uh, we're keeping an eye on our buddy at all times that we're staying orientated. Another thing we wanted to make sure to do is we always want to make sure we monitor our own gas. Here's my rule of thumb on that is I always say every two minutes or anytime you see something interesting, we're going to see a lot of sand. So make sure you do that every two minutes. Um, you're going to see a lot of sand. Um, so maybe every time you see a rock bigger than six inches, you check your gas, right? Um, so check your gas and your, your orientation every single time. Just before we start our dive, take a quick compass reading. Make sure that you know, okay, this is the direction I'm leaving. Um, a reciprocal compass reading to that is going to be 180 degrees. So if I'm going out at 30 degrees, I need to return at 210 degrees. Easy enough. Yeah. We're going to make sure we're, we're checking that out. So we want to orientate ourselves with navigation because it's very, very easy to get down there in the dark in limited visibility and get turned around. Ryrie is famous for there's some spots where if you go out far enough, um, as you're coming back up, you'll feel like you're coming up the, the shore. And then all of a sudden, it'll start going back down. Yikes. And, if, and if you're not quite sure what's going on, it's enough to mess with your head and give you the idea, wait a minute, am I going the wrong direction? And if you don't have a good a compass reading on that, it's very easy for this terrain to mess with you and think, oh, my God, I'm going back down again. I'm not I'm going the wrong way and then turn around and get and, and cause a problem. So make sure you have a good orientation um, that we practice communicating with a buddy. Uh, my wife and I use this symbol a lot, and that's kind of a multi-symbol for us. I love you, of course, but I'm having a good time. Life is good. Everything's fine. I'm having fun um, and making sure that I'm okay as well. And I return, yes, I'm okay. I'm having fun, and you're having fun, so awesome. Um, lost buddy procedure. This is a real thing that happens in Ryrie more than I'd like to admit, um, especially with visibility. If we're not paying attention with just the three of us, it shouldn't be a bad deal. But what happens if we lose David, Gail? Um, you and I wait there for, like, once we realize, we kind of wait there for, like, one minute, usually, and then. Not just wait, but what else should we do while we're waiting? Like, look around, make sure, you know, keep an eye on all your surroundings. Absolutely. And, and pressures. Make we three 360 circles of looking up and down all around, because yeah. remember, we're all of a sudden in a, a 360 environment. So everything around us, it's yep. I, I, one of my favorite things to do to new divers as I bring them down. Uh, I get them in buddy teams and, and I'll see one of them at 15 feet and one of them at 20 feet. And I'll be at 22 feet and I'll, I'll look over to the diver and I'll say, you, where's your buddy? And immediately they just, they get on this pan and they just look around. Ooh, and, look and then all of a sudden they come back at me. They're like, I don't know. And I'm like, look up. And yeah. their, their dive buddy's right above them. It's awesome. It's one of my favorite games of all time. <laughs> so be aware. Make sure you're looking up at all times. So another thing to be aware of is the set procedures. As we're going up, we want to make sure a couple of things. One, we're doing a safety stop. We're going deeper. Yeah. So safety stops become substantially more important to us. Um, and I'm going to teach you guys a different kind of safety stop here in a minute. But one of the things we want to make sure that we're always coming up with at least 50 bar or 500 PSI at a minimum. We, we need to be at the surface of that. So what I'm going to tell you guys tomorrow is the minute you guys hit 1,000 PSI, I need to know immediately because we're ending the dive right then and there. We're going to head up the surface. We're going to do our safety stop. We're going to pop. We're going to head up. The minute okay. one of you sees 1,000, I need to know immediately. Or even close. Say again? Or even close. I mean, even close. If you're 1,100 or yeah. in that point... Once you hit 1,000 PSI, I need to know, hey, get my attention. Hey, I'm yeah. 1,000. Just just let me know. Or you can 1,000. Yep. 1,000. One just keep doing that and just let me know. I'm going to be like, good to go. Call the dive. Head out. And we'll, I will take you back across. We're going to go across the Great Plains, which is a long, uh, flat uh, cycle. And we're going to head back up the shore. We're going to come to our safety stop. So we want to make sure... We have enough gas, but that's going to be our bingo gas time is when you when you get to.
to a thousand um, psi. If you're at 900 psi, I need to know. I, I want to know before you get to the thousand, but um, as you get to that point, I need to know immediately. So we're going to talk a little bit about a little bit about this and a little bit more in depth. But we all know the sign of, the sign and symbol for um, the safety stop. And this one, he's probably telling. I think he's telling us four minutes because he's got his pinky up there as well. But really. We want to make sure we're very defined in this. I always like to put my, the front of my hand toward. I hate doing the back of the hand. I always do the front of the hand so I can see it. Three three minutes safety stop. So make sure you. I can see all the fingers because in his case, he's kind of like this. Yeah. Is that four? Is that five? Three minutes. Almost stop that with people. Okay, all the people need to stay at the. Exactly. Yeah. Four minutes safety stop. Five minutes safety stop. Right. I want to see the front of the. The front of your hand or the back of your hand right here, front of your hand, I guess. So make sure I can see it so I know what's going on, right? right. So be very clear. I think this is a very bad example of how to tell me I'm at a safety stop. Um, so just be aware. Be very clear on that. So as we kind of think about safety stops, I want to kind of talk about something called M value. Have you guys heard this term before? I don't think so. Uh -uh. Okay. So M value. No worries. This is yeah, probably the first time you've seen this. So M value, I'll ex let me explain it just a little bit for you. So M value is a theoretical amount of nitrogen that a cell can tolerate before it starts off gassing in a dangerous way. Oh. Easy enough. Okay. So as the cell builds up a, a specific amount of nitrogen, there's a specific amount that it can hold. And M value is the maximum amount of value a cell can, ha can hold. Easy enough. We're on gassing, we're off gassing. Now, mm -hmm. here's where it gets interesting, in my opinion, is that this M value is a theoretical area. And what we discover is in the M value that an actual point, there's a safety margin. We don't know exactly where that safety margin is, but what we do know is that when we do less decompression time or sh uh, shorter safety stops, we start moving up into the red and we start moving Pat, from sil silent bubbles to symptomatic bubbles with less decompression time. We're not giving those nitrogen bubbles enough time to bubble off. And as we create larger bubbles, we create more risk. Now, right. as we do more longer safety stops, um, we allow those bubbles to bubble off much, slow, much slower and much smaller, and we create less risk, and we become less problematic or less symptomatic. Now, the problem is, is there is no hard, fast line Gail, how you off-gas nitrogen and how, David, how you off-gas nitrogen are going to be different. And here's where it really kind of spins your brain is that, Gail, today, you may be able to off-gas nitrogen at 10,000 uh, bubbles per liter per hour. Tomorrow, it might be 12,000 or it might be 8,000. Oh, different it every day. A lot of different factors. It depends on your hydration, how tired you are. What kind of fight you had with David because he didn't pick up his damn socks again? Um, it, it, there's a lot of factors that involve of how you off-gas nitrogen, right? Did you drink Gatorade before the dive? Don't do that. Gatorade before a dive is not a good thing. Okay. But as, as you go through this process, realize that your uh, ability to off-gas nitrogen will change day to day. And how you off-gas nitrogen is different than how I off-gas nitrogen. And it's very different than how David off-gases nitrogen. So as we look at this chart... We're never quite sure where we're on this. Only thing we can tell for sure is the simple fact that if we give ourselves more of a, and a longer safety stop, especially when we start talking cold and altitude, um, that we are um, allowing ourselves a better safety margin and staying away from that M, that hard, fast M value that's individual to us. So be aware. Here's the takeaways I want you guys to do. Dive tables and safety stops are how divers manage the size of the bubbles in their bloodstream. Safety stops assist in the reduction of the size of those bubbles. Three, there is no clear line between good and bad. And four, every diver is different in the way that their body manages the size of the bubbles and the reduction of the nitrogen. Takeaway, do a safety stop. Yeah. Now, okay. here's where we get a little different. This is something I know you guys haven't seen before, um, and it's new for you. So we did a, uh, TDI did a study, and what they determined is from three different groups of divers. Uh, all these divers did a dive for 25 minutes to 120 feet. Diver group A did a direct ascent to the surface without a safety stop. What they determined is at the 16-minute mark, 
they had 118,000 bubbles per cubic liter. It's a lot of freaking bubbles. And as you see that uh, most commonly, signs and symptoms of DCS and bubbles don't start to really get to their high point until about 15 to 16 minutes after you as, as surface um, out of the water. Wow. So at the 30 minute mark, they'd gone down to 60,000 uh, bubbles per cubic liter. Um, at the 60 minute mark, they were still uh, 25 to 30,000. And even at two hours, they were still at 19,000 bubbles per cubic mm -hmm. liter. Now, group number two was a little smarter. They did a two minute safety stop at three feet, or at, I'm sorry, at 10 feet. So three that's meter, all. Yeah. Yep, that's the only difference. 10 feet, two minutes. Look how much less nitrogen they are offloading. Mm. They still had their high point, 20,000 bubbles uh, per cubic liter at 15 minutes, but it reduced, reduced, reduced. And finally, at the two hour mark, they were down to about 5,000 bubbles per cubic liter. Now we have dive group number three. They stopped at 20 feet for one minute and 10 feet for four minutes. So they did a total of a five minute safety stop. What we determined is at 15 minutes, they were at about five to 6,000 bubbles per cubic liter. At 30 minutes, they'd come up a little bit, but at the 42 minute mark, they were at zero bubbles per cubic liter. Wow. That's Sorry. huge. It's, it's massive. And the great thing is, is this is the dive group uh, C is the most safe. If they're doing multiple dives, they are the safest dive group in the water by far. By far. So be aware, a longer safety stop is huge. And if you do a one minute at 20 feet and four minutes at 10 feet, you're going to off-gas a ton of nitrogen. So the takeaway I want you to get from so, this. Uh, can I ask, can I ask how does it compare to five minutes at 15 feet? Uh, we don't have that data. Um, unfortunately, they, they did the uh, 20 feet at for one minute, but I can tell you that uh, um, five minutes at 15 feet does fairly similar. My wife and I have something called an O-dive. We have our own Doppler radar um, that measures the size and uh, quantity of bubbles in our arterial gas network. And what we've discovered is um, my wife and I tend to be too safe, is, according to the Doppler, is uh, we do a longer safety stops and longer decos than needed. Um, and because of that, we generally come up with next to no nitrogen. Um, it does the first measurement at 30 minutes after a dive and the second measure 60 minutes after the dive. And even after a three hour uh, dive um, with 30 to 35 minutes of deco, um, because of the way we do our deco stops and doing that five minutes at uh, 20 feet or 15 feet in that area, we generally at, at the hour mark have zero residual nitrogen uh, typically. And that's doing deco dives. So our... Oh, wow. our our computer often tells me that I'm we're too safe, <laughs> that we we can, we can push the limit a little bit more. I'm okay with being too safe. I have no yeah, issues right. with that at all. Um, so I tend to be a, a, a very safe and thoughtful diver. Um, so here's the takeaways from this last slide that I want you guys to be aware of. A safety stop reduces bubbles. A longer safety stop reduces more bubbles than a shorter one. And a five-minute safety stop during a repetitive dive increases the safety margin dramatically. Do a safety stop. Easy enough? Okay. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. It's pretty straightforward. It's definitely not rocket science. So take your time, do a safety stop. So potential hazards in deep diving. The first one's going to be regular icing. We're going to go down and it's going to get a little chilly down there, right? So mm -hmm. be aware that as gas decompresses, um, it becomes colder. So typically the gas you're breathing that's coming out of your regulator will be around 15 to 20 degrees, degrees colder than the ambient temperature around it. Now where that starts getting really important is if you're doing a 40 degree dive and it's coming out 20 degrees colder, the air is coming out at 20 degrees. Mm -hmm. If there's moisture in your regulator and it's not a cold water regular rated regulator, it can absolutely freeze up. I've seen this happen. Nikki was doing, uh, we were doing a dive together and she pulled, uh, we were gonna launch an SMB and she pulled her safety second off and she used it to fill uh, her SMB. That's the way we used to do it. Now we do it um, straight above us with the gas we're breathing. But she it, it took she had it on free flow for about 10 seconds at best, maybe not even that. And in that 10 seconds at 33 degree water, it froze her regulator open. So it was wow. in pure free flow. So as she sent the SMB up, went to free flow. She went ahead and started her ascent, did her three minute safety stop, got to the surface and um, within a few minutes of her surfacing and starting to swim towards shore, she was out of gas. So be aware, it's definitely something that happens. 
Another thing to be aware of is external and internal icing. So as you start getting into colder weather and colder, uh, colder dives, be aware that external icing is a real thing. So make sure you, uh, as you start doing these deeper dives, having a balanced and cold reg water rated regulator, if you're doing um, uh, dives in high elevation or locally around here is definitely to your advantage. Now, one of the other big considers that really we get into that's more of more concern right now is something magically called nitrogen narcosis. Nitrogen narcosis is a real thing that happens more than most people realize. Uh, and it's a, a real meaningful thing. So what ends up happening is when you get down to 60 feet uh, and below, the amount of nitrogen uh, in the air that you're breathing starts becoming problematic and creating a narcotic effect. Uh, and that's definitely something to be aware of is as it's created this narcotic effect, we have to be aware that this can be a problem. And so I'm pulling up the slides on that. Give me one second. I actually clicked off the slide that I wanted. Uh, and I forgot what page I was on. There we go. So there's a lot of different theories of what nitrogen narcosis is um, and how it uh, how it comes about. Some of the common theories are the quasi-metabolic theory, the uh, the clathrate uh, theory, the iceberg theory, the Myers-Overton theory is the is the leading theory on that. Basically, the basic idea of nitrogen narcosis is that it reduces the neurons in your brain ability to transmit information. Simple enough. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it, it mimics and feels like um, an actual narcotic effect. I happen to have a fun little video. Let's see if it, it will play for us. Let me stop the green screen and represent re here. It's being ornery for me today. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> One of the best things about diving is the effects of nitrogen narcosis. <laughs> it's like being drunk underwater. You don't get any of the hangover. Some divers get not easier than others. It just depends on how deep you go and how susceptible you are to the calls of the nitrogen mistress. Now, as you all probably know, some people do pretty stupid stuff when drunk. All you have to do is visit your local drunk tank at the police station on a Friday night and ask what they're in for. Or if you're the one in the drunk tank, the, the cops will tell you why you're there in the following morning. <laughs> But people do some stupid stuff when narked, and most people don't even know they're narked. So it can be useful for you to understand some telltale signs that your buddy is narked so that you can be the designated diver and look after them and get them home safely. And such, hi, I'm Mark, and here are five ways to tell if your dive buddy is narked. They keep staring at themselves in your mask. You're effectively drugged by the gas that you are breathing the deeper you go. As such, your inhibitions are lessened. And as we all know, we are all narcissists at heart when we lose our inhibitions, aren't we? No. I mean, let's face it, I'll bet you anything that your social media picture is you scuba diving, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Not men and women are like magpies, and they love shiny objects. And when they look at you, they're probably not actually looking and engaging with you. They're just looking at themselves or the mirror copy of themselves from the mirror dimension in the shiny lens of your mask. Do you find them buddy breathing with a fish? I've actually heard this a couple of times, and this is the other type of drunk, the considerate drunk. These narked individuals will be concerned at all of the fish in the water and their lack of breathing apparatus. After all, they've spent a lot of time learning how important their regulators are and to always keep breathing. So they'll often donate their regulator to these fish that, to be honest, they, they don't really need it. They wave back at fish. <laughs> the third type of drunk is the happy drunk, who is observant and sees his crowds of fans in the fishes and all their little fins waving at them. So it would be rude not to wave back. Right? Yeah, if your buddy is waving back at the fish, they're probably not, or, you know, way too young to be scuba diving. <laughs> Mental age. <clears throat> fish are cool, and they move their pectorals pretty much all the time, but while they are aware that you are there, I'm sorry, but they, they ain't waving at you. <laughs> 
documentary, those yeah. were. Their mask fogs underwater and they spit in it. Much like people who keep the outside of their mask before a dive, you aren't going to get much benefit of spitting in your mask during the dive. I have seen this before and it was a dive guide, so I really hope he wasn't knocked at the time. I just figured he was showing off. Your mask fogs up and he spits in your mask. <laughs> Not said order of them, but just stay away from my mask. I can do it myself. So what have you seen in the wild from the rare underwater species Homo narcosis? Uh, let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching. Say bye. We are Kind of a fun video. I, I like that one from Mark or Chubba Scuba. Um, but kind of the, the thing to be aware of is nitrogen narcosis is a real thing. And so some of the precluding factors and the things that cause uh, predisposing factors that cause nitrogen narcosis are interesting to kind of look at. Now, as we go through this, I want you guys to think about it and tell me if this is an internal created problem or an external created problem or both. OK, so here's some of the precluding factors. Carbon dioxide buildup, internal, external. I think internal. Well, I Absolutely. think it was, yeah. Absolutely. Carbon dioxide means I'm probably holding my breath or maybe I'm, mm -hmm. I'm hyperventilating, right? Yeah. Rapid, rapid descent. Internal. Absolutely. I mean, you, you created it. Exactly. Cold. External. External. Uh, yeah. Well, you chose to go there. <laughs> I mean, if you're choosing to dive in cold water, you should be prepared. Exactly. So an external factor creating an internal effect. Right. Are Drug you cold or is the temperature cold? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Drugs or medications. Internal. Exactly. Limited visibility or darkness. External. External. Unless it's your mass fogging up that's internal <laughs> but does this fall into the same category as cold is that an external factor creating internal effect right yeah yeah story for time for you so i was six years old my dad bought me a gun rack to put in my room and I, and put a, a, a nice toy m1 rifle on it and bought me the coolest metal korean war helmet uh, uh kevlar style helmet you've ever seen it was super neat and he hung it on the on the uh, rack. Well, I didn't get to go to bed till late that night because it was my birthday. And when I got to bed, um, I, the there was a, the window was open and a breeze came in, and the shadow of that helmet looked like a head of a, somebody standing in the corner of my room. Oh no! I was terrified. I kept yeah. the, the sheets up to my nose, and I watched the person in the corner of my room all <laughs> night long. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Finally, the morning rays about 5 a.m. came through, and I saw that it was the damn helmet. I was like, ah, oh, I can't believe it. And it's an external factor, but it created a mental – nothing changed. Yeah. It was the same helmet day or night, right? And so yeah. that's what things – as we start going into limited visibility, it has a huge mental effect on us, right? Because all yeah. of a sudden, if we can't see where things are, are at, um, because darkness or limited visibility – I told you about my dive on the river where – the visibility is literally here. If I wasn't comfortable in a strong diver, that would really mess with my head. So yeah. high air consumption, internal or external? Internal. Absolutely. Something's got me going on. Probably the limited visibility. Yeah. <laughs> oh, crap. Right? Freaking out. And you're getting carbon dioxide too much. You're hyperventilating. Stop. Exactly. <laughs> Inexperience at depths below 60 feet. Well internal but also external because you haven't you have to get it to get experience you have to do it so exactly so <laughs> i want to come back to that one as well uh, I, I made myself a note but help me remember to come back to inexperience at depths below 60 feet so i want to talk about that for a little bit okay. um task loading internal external you mean like you giving us a task to do could be that. Could be actual things happening. Mask broke and you ran out of gas at the same time. Oh. And then you start hyperventilating and freaking out. Internal. Uh, a, a little of both. Absolutely. 
One of my favorite courses to teach is called uh, solo diving. And one of the things I like to do is that I take my divers to 66 feet and I make sure that we're diving air and I get them to one minute to deco. Now, before we get to that point, what I've done is I, I like to run a line out that's 100 feet long. And I tell them that I want them to swim the line down and count the fin strokes down and back. And I have them do it four times. Well, as soon as they take off to go down to the end of the line, the first thing I do is I, I get in the dirt. I push the dirt up. I kick it up. I, I kill the visibility like you would not believe. I'm, it's fun. I have a great time with it. I mean, I'm throwing dirt in the air and it's, it's crap. And they come <laughs> back and they look and they're like, what the hell happened? It was pretty good visibility when I left, but now it's like crap. And I tell them <laughs> to go back, go back down again. And I do the same thing. I, I kill the viz. And I try and time it out so that when they come back on the second time, um, that uh, they're within about one minute of deco decompression time. And as soon as they get back, I tell them mask is broken. Regulator, you are out of gas. Launch your SMB. And so I, I give them three tasks right then and there. And they're within one minute of deco. So I have definitely task loaded them up. Yeah. Now, here's the fun part about it. The first thing you do is all they in solo class, they're carrying another bottle. Simply grab the other regulator, take it out, put your primary, the secondary in, get a breath off your, your secondary cylinder, and you're good to go. To, to fix the next issue, all you need to do is ascend in the water column 10 feet. If you ascend in the water column by 10 feet, you, oh, will, you will go from one minute of deco to 10 minutes till deco. Oh. You'll get 10 minutes of decompression time. And then at that point, then you can switch your mask to a non-broken mask. Once you switch your mask, then you can launch your SMB. At so one point, you, go ahead. Do you always carry a second mask when you're solo diving? I do. Um, I'll have a second a mask. Idea. Tomorrow, yeah. um, I redundancy. So as we go through this, at what now when I start give, gave you the set of instructions and I told you all four things that were happening, at what point did I tell you that they all had to happen at the exact same time? Never. Never. Not, not once, not ever. I'll never do that. But you have to figure it all out at the same time. So task loading, the secret to task loading, and I take this from Mike Young. Mike Young is a world-famous uh, cave diver, uh, holds a bunch of records and um, owns a rebreather company. He's a pretty amazing guy. His his solution to task loading and problems is, is I stop, I breathe, I think, and I make sure that whatever my next action is, is going to take me that much closer to safety and not, and not take me away from safety. So I do whatever the one thing that will get me closer to safety. In that particular case, gas. I'm going to yeah. switch over to back up gas. Okay, yeah. what's next? Ascend in the water column. Get some more time, right? right. Reduce, time. Yeah, yeah get, get, that, get that farther away from the non-decompression limit. After that, switch my mask. After that, launch my SMB. But Think, stop, think, breathe, or, and breathe, and uh, or stop, breathe, think, and get through the situation and, and make sure you're doing the next thing that needs to happen that will get you closer to safety. So task loading is completely internal. It's always internal. You can always okay. stop, breathe, think, and then make your okay. correct action. Um, lack of sleep. Internal, external? Internal. Absolutely. Exertion. Uh, internal, internal, Absolutely. Internal. you can always slow down. Yeah. Um, slow down. My personal favorite psychological outlook, expecting narcosis to be more severe. That's internal for sure. Absolutely. Anxiety. Internal time. Breathing. Absolutely. Time pressures. Say again, time pressures, time pressure. Um, go up. Well, it's internal. I would, I would well, I would say it's kind of external, but yet you can control it, so it's kind of internal. Creates an internal effect, and then finally fatigue. Yeah. Internal, absolutely. So here's the interesting thing about that: we went through and all the precluding, predisposing factors that create more severe symptoms of nitronarcosis are all internal, internal between yeah. our ears, right? So that's one of the things I want you to think about. And that's why I talk about this is in two ways. Is first off, when I teach people to dive, I teach you to do nothing. That's my goal. I want you to focus on this square foot of ocean and this square foot of ocean only. And after okay. you get this square foot of ocean figured out, let's move over to the next square foot of ocean. I promise you, 
We don't need to see the whole damn lake in one dive. It will be there tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day. <laughs> we had a, we dove with the ranger on Saturday that had some ear problems and she was so disappointed. She's like, I can't believe I didn't get to do the dive. I'm like, well, Yellowstone Lake's been here for a half a million years. So yeah, I'm guessing, I'm guessing it'll be here tomorrow and maybe the day yeah. after. So <laughs> or the next eruption is not due for 113,000 years. So I think we got a couple minutes left for us. Right. So it's <laughs> Right, so focus on this square foot of ocean, right? Yep. Now, I want to kind of revisit the inexperience at depths below 60 feet. Now, one of the things, the uh, debates that's going on right now in the dive community is, do I have the ability to manage narcosis better or become less um, or more tolerant of nar narcosis? For example, um, if, I if I drank a tall boy, I couldn't walk a straight line. I just don't drink, right? My son-in-law can drink uh, six tall boys in a row and he can still walk a straight line. Now, is that because he's built up a tolerance to it or he has experience with it and he's more practiced in the skills he needs at the end of the six tall boys? Well, a little bit of both, depending on how much tolerance he's built up. But that, again, the tolerance could just be getting used to it. Exactly. And so right now, Scripps Institute and Dan are both uh, leaning towards the side of experience doing the tasks at the uh, narcotic level. So that's the, that's where the research is currently <laughs> leading. And that's why we say having experience at that. It's not that um, it's not affecting you, but you are able to build up a stronger muscle memory of doing the tasks and how to do the tasks um, so that you're able to accomplish them more thoughtfully, if that makes any sense at all. Yeah. So one of the things I would like you to guys, if you don't take anything else away from my class tonight, I would like you to take this away, please. All the skills that I will teach you that you've learned in dive class that you will ever learn diving are all perishable. Yeah. What do you think I mean by that? All the skills I'm going to teach you are perishable. It means they'll go out of your brain. You need what you need is repetitive and have it muscle memory. Absolutely. But you need to keep doing it because muscle memory goes away as well. It's true. Did you play sports in high school? A little bit. I did basketball and, and golf. How, now, when you were playing basketball all the time, how good at the free, flow, free throw were you? <laughs> not the greatest. But <laughs> not either. I'm, I'm sure you could make a few, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are you as accurate now as you were then? Oh, no. Not <laughs> at all. Right on. <laughs> so most of it goes away. So what I want you guys to do is uh, before you guys go diving, um, on a regular basis, I'd like you to pull out your SMB. Refamiliarize yourself with how to launch an SMB. When you're on the dive boat, go through basic skills in your mind first. How do I do an air sharing ascent? What does that look like? How do I launch an SMB? What happens if? How do I clear my mask? Go through your soft skills between your ears first. So build them up and then practice them. Don't be afraid at home. Uh, to pull David aside and say, okay, I'm out of air, share. What does that look like? If you guys would like, I'd be happy to send you over the list of um, structure of how, how to do an air sharing ascent. I've got it written out from the RSTC of how you should do a primary, um, uh, primary air share pass. I mean, it's step by step. With your right hand, grab the hose at the point where it meets the second stage. Take a deep breath and present that directly by putting it in directly in front of the mouth of the person who needs to donate air. With your left hand, grab their left strap. With your right hand, now grab your, your octo, pull it clearly and put it in your mouth, clear it and breathe. With that right hand, now free, take and switch your left hand for your right hand <laughs> like your right, right strap. I've got it written out. I'm happy to share it with you so you guys have that opportunity to read through it. But all these skills are all... So but to, I don't think I've ever heard it, but so step by step, step by step. Yeah. Well, I've got cool. it written out, yeah. Okay. Now, every instructor should have a copy of that somewhere in their stuff. I'm happy to give, uh, give you a copy of it. Um, when I teach my open water classes, I read that whole step by step process before every class and I read it with my class. So awesome. I'm well practice in it. Um, and I'm happy to provide it to you guys as well, but they're soft skills. Easy enough. It, it just understanding what those soft skills are and reading through it. 
preparing and practicing. Practice at home before you go on your dive trip. It won't hurt, right? Yeah. And it's kind of fun. You're doing you're doing an activity together. You're a couple. You're doing cool stuff. <laughs> It is cool. It's a couple building exercise. Yes. There you go. <laughs> yes. So that's one of the things I would uh, I would encourage. Now, it, and that will help you with your experience below 60 feet because if you're able to build a strong muscle memory on how to do these simple skills, um, it'll make your life a lot easier. So easy enough. Perfect. So as we go through this, one of the things to be aware of is the signs and symptoms of nitronarcosis. What does that look like? Um, so... Here's what I, I have for you. Now, here's here's one of the things. I want you to re please be aware. Nitronarcosis reminds me much of the frog in the pot. We all know that story, right? If you a boiling oh, yeah. frog, they don't notice it. They don't hop out and they get boiled, right? So yeah. so the signs and symptoms of nitronarcosis um, are this. A feeling of relaxation, lightheadedness, euphoria or loopiness, slowed response, a feeling of well-being, increasing judgmental errors or giddiness. Deterioration of fine dexterity, fixation on ideas, time distortion, deterioration of multitask reasoning, <coughs> tingling, sleepiness, inability to remember parts of the dive. I was on a dive uh, about a year and a half ago with my wife. We were diving the Lady Luck, and uh, there was another couple, and they were for about 10 minutes. They swam around this seven foot seahorse, gold seahorse on the stern of the ship. Um, it's a cool thing. I, I love the seahorse on the ship, right? And they came back up and we were, we were on the deck and, and the husband was asking the wife, what'd you think of the seahorse? And she looked at him deadpan serious and says, what seahorse? And he was confused. Oh. He's like, um, the seahorse, you swam around for like 10 minutes. And she had no memory. She was at 125 feet. So she was absolutely positively narked. Oh, um, wow. Absolutely. So and it's a very easy thing. She didn't realize she was narked. She handled the dive just fine. Right. So inability to remember parts of the dive, confusion, semi-conscious, disorientation, memory of the dive, decreased conceptual reasoning, visual hallucinations. We had a diver one time in our group that was about 120 feet. They were doing this and laughing hysterically. And I can tell you, <laughs> 25 times faster underwater, so, or, or four times faster underwater. So what uh, was happening, we could hear her laughing. My students hear me laughing at them all the time. I, it's, it's very clear. I I, I tell them, don't worry, guys. I'm not laughing with you. I'm laughing at you because you're doing silly things. <laughs> well, good. I, at least I'm honest, right? I'm not, not going right? to be at you. Doing, If you do stupid things, I will laugh at you. Um, we'll enjoy it. I'm not, you know, I'm not making fun of you, but I'm, we're having fun, right? So we, heard, so we grabbed her by the arm and we took her to the boat. We asked, what the hell were you doing? And she says, well, I was parting the sea so I could see the mermaids dancing. Oh, <laughs> my. Wow. Absolutely. Visual human, yeah. so that falls under visual hallucinations, auditory hallucination. They're the one to be aware of paranoia or anxious feelings. So here's how I describe diving. Diving is the most self-aware sport you will ever be in. How you feel going in the water is how you should feel coming out of the water. So for example, one of the things I do for myself, especially on deco dives or deeper dives or ice dives or cold water dives, any dives pretty much that I'm, I'm going where it's going to be colder water past 50 feet, I do basic math um, in my head. I do simple math reasoning. I, I calculate my gas. I'll, I'll actually multiply out and figure out how many liters are, are left in my tank. I'll do little math question quizzes in my head. Um, I had a situation last summer in early June where I was, um, I'd was i actually gotten hypothermia during a dive because I had a leak in my dry suit. And I couldn't do the math. I was at 50 feet. And I couldn't figure out what at 30 feet per minute with a three-minute safety stop, how long it would take me to get to the surface. Oh, I was like you were 50 feet down. I was 50 feet down and I couldn't figure out 50, at 30 feet per minute for 50 feet plus three minute safety stop. How long would it take me to get to the surface? I couldn't do it. And when I realized wow. that I, I went ahead and called the dive and I started heading the surface watching my computer. Luckily got to the, to the time and I, I let my computer figure out the safety stop for me. And then I went to the surface and, and swam to shore, but I couldn't do simple reasoning like that. It happens. It absolutely happens. And instructors are the worst. We're like, oh, I can do this. I'm Superman. And we're stupid, right? It is. I think it's probably more being a, a guy but um, and than an instructor. But it could be, maybe it's a combination. Maybe I'm tenfold more prone to that. But, uh, be aware that it happens. It absolutely happens. But it's much like a frog in a pot. By the time it had happened, I realized what was going on. It was there. I was just lucky enough to realize, oh, crap. 
Um, so it was just definitely one of those things. So you couldn't feel yourself getting colder? Um, I could feel myself getting colder, but I couldn't feel myself going into hypothermia. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was one one dive my brother and I did kind of later in the year. Yeah. And we were getting hypothermic, but we didn't realize how hypothermic we were until we got out of the water. And then we started shivering. Yep, it happens. So just be aware, it absolutely happens. Um, it is a real thing. So be aware that you need to really kind of keep an eye on where you're at on the dive and how things are feeling. So one of the things you might ask yourself is, does nitrogen or narcosis cause any complications? Gail, that is a fantastic question. Thank you for asking that, by the way. I super appreciate that. Uh, so <laughs> here's the thing. Nitrogen narcosis is fairly common and it's temporary, but that doesn't mean that it can't have lasting effects. Now, some divers who develop nitrogen narcosis become too disoriented to swim to shallower water. And in other cases, a diver can slip into a coma while still deep underwater. Now, wow. trying to get yourself back to the surface can also lead to complications. If you rise too quickly, you could develop decompression sickness, often called the beds, right? So mm -hmm. um, seek emergency treatment if you experience any of the following symptoms after you come back after a dive. Now, again, remember, as you feel going in the water is how you should feel coming out of the water. If you feel anything that is not in line with how you went in the water, I need to know immediately. So here's the, the deal. If you can feel fatigue, appetite loss, headache, tendon, joint, or muscle pain, swelling, dizziness, pain in the chest, trouble breathing, double vision, speaking difficulties, muscle weakness, primarily on the left side of your body, or flu-like symptoms. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I think we lost you. If you can hear us, we can't hear you. Is it frozen? Well, the time is still going. It still says live, 156, 41. Uh, we can see us, but we lost him. I don't know if that's us or him, then. It could be our internet. Yeah. It could be our internet. I wonder if we can refresh. Can we refresh it. Mm -hmm. Is he going to call you? Maybe you have your phone. Where's your phone? Oh no, we lost him. Internet's fine for me. I don't. I think I left my phone out there. We may be back. No. You know where it is? I think maybe in the kitchen or the front room. There it is. He texted. Is it internet? <laughs> is that what he said? Yeah. So should we restart? There we go. Oh, he's here. I'm back. Okay. Hello. Yep, I just texted I, I text you as well. So yep. sorry. Yes. Stupid internet. All right. right. So <laughs> again, be aware. Anytime you feel any symptoms that are out of the normal, please let me know immediately. Um, so as you feel going in the water is how you should feel coming out. So, so just yes, curious. One of the things, one of the first symptoms I've heard of for decompression sickness was like tingling skin. Is that is that, that is common or is, it's, is that one say, of the first symptoms? I wouldn't say common, but it, it's uh, the it definitely a sign and symptom of level one uh, DCS. Uh, level one is called the skin bends, and what's happening is the bubbles in the of nitrogen are so fine and small they've gone from uh, silent bubbles to bubble seeds that are just slightly on the larger side. And they try and escape through the, the um, best way they can, and they go through the skin. So they cause a tingling in the skin or a skin rash. So you'll, um, it's pretty common. Level two of the bends is when it starts getting trapped in the joints. And when it starts getting cap trapped in the joints, it causes uh, joint pain. And in that same line of DCS, 
um, you get these bubbles that come through. And one of the things that happens when you get sick, let's kind of back up, is the white blood cells see something in your in your system that shouldn't be there, and they go to war. And when they go to war, it causes problems. It causes you to have muscle fatigue. Well, same mm-hmm. same thing happens with DCS. As it's your white blood cells start seeing those nitrogen bubbles come through, they're like, whoa, whoa, dude, those are not supposed to be here. And so they go to war with them. And that's where you start getting muscle ache and muscle problems as well. Okay. So that's DCS level two. DCS level three is we start getting severe pain. Um, and you, um, it gets to the point where you need to double over and, and you're doubling over pain. And that's when it gets super serious in that those bubbles are large enough to co- start causing blockages. They can cause blockages in the arteries. They can cause blockages in the heart. And more importantly, they can cause blockages in the brain. Um, so the good news is, is uh, typically with any, um, like an AGE, arterial gas embolism, um, uh, um, anything like that, uh, see the bends, DCS, um, subcutaneous emphysema, if you can get to a chamber within four and a half hours, you have a 92% chance of 100% recovery. So okay. the good news is, is you're, you're pretty set. Uh, if something if, happens, so, go ahead. So say that again, when, even at a level three, if you can get there in four and a half hours, you have a 95% recovery. A 92% chance of a hundred percent recovery. Oh, that's huge. Better than I thought. That's pretty good. Absolutely. And it's one of the reasons that we put you on pure auction is to help start flushing that nitrogen out even faster so that you're able to uh, get that nitrogen out of your system. So we put you on pure auction and that helps a lot. Oh, okay. They did say that in the, in the class. So, you know, the, the online stuff, they're like kind of the, whether you have nitrogen narcosis or whether you have the uh, decompression sickness, Oxygen, 100%, is what helps both of them. So, mm-hmm. Absolutely. So in nitrogen narcosis, the main treatment for nitrogen narcosis is simply getting yourself back to the surface. If, you're yeah. si- if your symptoms are mild, you can stay in shallower water with your dive partner or dive team uh, while you wait for them to clear up. Now, once your symptoms okay. have cleared, you can resume your dive at the shallower depth. Just make sure you don't return to depth where you started to having symptoms. Now, if your symptoms don't resolve once you reach that shallow water, you need to end your dive and go ahead and head to the surface. How do I explain in, like, I'm feeling something weird. Like, I know we do this a lot, but, like, do I do, like, my lips are tingling? I mean, how do you, absolutely. like... Absolutely. You can you can absolutely uh, come up with any anything like that. Um, and here's the cool thing. I, I want you guys to be very clear on this. Anybody can end a dive at any time for any reason without consequence. And here's why. So, Gail, if you and I suddenly became best buddies in the entire world and and, and uh, we decided that um, uh, Nikki and David just didn't have time to go on a vacation, we're go, we go to Truck Lagoon together. Um, we're hanging out. We're best buds, high-fiving, woo, you know, uh, drinking beer together, whatever we do, right, uh, having mm-hmm. fun. And uh, we go for a dive because we and we spent $12,000 to get there. Nick. Gail, you and I get to 20 feet. We're there for tw- two minutes, and you end the dive at the surface. If I come to the surface and I throw a little man fit, go, yeah, why did you enter 10,000? Just throw one of those stupid man fits. How safe would you be on dive two? No, not at all. Absolutely. You wouldn't want to tell me shit, right? No. <laughs> you would be pretty <laughs> like, oh, oh, oh. So anybody can end a dive at any time for any reason without consequence. Now, if you ended early at two minutes, I may come and say, hey, you okay, Gail? What's going on? Help me understand. And there is, you don't have to give me a reason, but if you just say, hey, I just wasn't feeling it, I'm cool with that. Sometimes you just got to reset the dive. Uh, one of my students this over this uh, last winter, I was doing ice diving. He was in the hole for, in the ice hole for two minutes. And this is a, re- a former Marine, pretty tough little kid um, and a uh, pretty tough guy. And he was in there for two minutes. And he, he popped up. He says, hey, I need to reset this dive. I would like out of the hole. Absolutely. We pulled him out of the hole, de geared him, got in the ice tent, let him um, heat himself up and take the time. I gave him a big high five. I am very proud of Donnie that he took the time to say, I'm not feeling it. I need to reset my dive. Cool. I will absolutely, every time, if you need to reset your dive, absolutely. One of my friends, um, I've got a, a, a dive friend. Her name's Jill Heinrich. You should look her up. You guys would be pretty impressed with her. She's, she's super neat. Um, I actually did an interview. If you haven't gone to my channel, Teach Me to Dive, you should. I've got a bunch of really, really cool interviews with amazing divers. Look up Jill Heinrich. She's a world-renowned diver. 
uh, National Geographic, uh, A and E, Discovery, all that kind of stuff, uh, all kinds of awards. Oh. Um, and uh, I asked her, I says, "When do you call a dive?" And she says, "I call dives all the time." She says, "In fact, a lot of times I'll go on dive trips, and I realize most dive accidents happen on the last day of the dive, and I'm a lot of times I'm just not feeling it on dive day five or six of diving." She says, a lot of times I'll just ride on the boat, just enjoy the water time and going out and seeing the pretty water and, and seeing the waves. She says, a lot of times I just call the dive. I don't, I don't care. She says, I, I learned early on that it's okay to call a dive and be okay with it. Okay. Yeah. Don't That's ever be good. afraid to call it. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, that is a huge, huge, huge key. Now we talked a little bit about it. I'm going to reshare my screen. But as we start getting down, we want to be aware that we've got to be able to make appropriate decisions. When something happens, I want you guys to get into the habit of being able to, and this is just a good, good law for life. The first thing, whenever there's a problem, I want you to stop. Breathe. Breathe. Think. And then make an appropriate decision on what you need to do. Here's the first time panic happened for me while diving. I was doing a deep dive class. I got down to 120 feet and I realized I had a really, really crappy light at the time. I realized I was starting to feel anxiety. Now, if you, as you guys get to know me, you'll realize that anxiety is not something that I deal with. It's I, I'm that guy that, okay, we're going into a plane. I'm going to jump out 12,000 feet. Fantastic. Can we have a shoot too? Oh, even better. Fantastic. I just, I'm just not that guy. Right. <laughs> You know, I'll climb a mountain. I'll just, I, I just, I don't have a tremendous amount of fear in my life, right? Uh, my fears are are stupid things of, uh, you know, not being able to support my family. That 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 scares me. Make my kids uh, falling off the roof. That scares me. But jumping out of a plane, doing you know, doing stupid stuff. I've got T-shirts that say "Go do dumb shit," right? That's actually what they say as well. Um, but I felt anxiety, and I was like, "Whoa, this ain't right. This is not me." So here's what I did. I stopped. I closed my eyes. I breathed in three nice, big, deep breaths. Because what ends up happening is you start to build that anxiety is what's happening is you're building up carbon dioxide in your system. Your natural brain, your, your natural caveman brain or cave woman or cave person brain starts when they start getting um, hypoxic, starts going into anxiety to figure out what the heck to do now to get away from it so they don't become hypoxic. So we take those three deep breaths. <sighs> And I cleared out the carbon dioxide. After I, I got those deep breaths, then I started thinking, okay, what's going on? My first thing is I'm starting to think is I always check my gas. Because for me, gas means time. Lots of gas means lots of time. Not as much gas means not much time. So it gives me an idea how much time I've got to make an appropriate decision. So, And, and I'm good about watching my gas. So I, I never get to the point where I have an emergency situation. I'm at a 500 PSI of gas because... I've got it in my head that I end my dives uh, and start heading to my safety stop on a recreational dive at 1,000 PSI. If I'm doing a deco dive, then I, pro I plan that accordingly. And I, I make sure that I start my deco stop somewhere around 1,500 PSI at least, sometimes 2,000 PSI, depending upon how much gas I'm carrying, how long I need to be at, at the deco stop as well. So I plan that accordingly ahead of time. Plan my dive, dive my plan. And I look at that. What's my gas time? And when that happened, I had 2,800 pounds of gas. I looked at it. I was like, well, I've got plenty of time to make a decision. So now I need to look around. Am I trapped? No, nothing's tangled me up. Can I make a direct ascent to the surface? Yes, absolutely. Is there a giant shark in Ryrie going to eat me? No, I'm good to go. So what am I freaking out about? It comes down to the same idea as the helmet in the corner of the room. Um, was it a scary thing? No, it was just the helmet in the corner room. It was not the boogeyman standing in the corner of my room trying, getting ready to chop me into little pieces, right? So as I realize the truth of what's going on, I'm able to ease my mind out. Think. Use the, the most important tool you guys will have by far is the six inches between your ears. Use it. <laughs> and once you've thought about it, I, I like what Mike Young says. He says, I, I make a decision that whatever I'm going to do next is what's going to take me closer to safety. Yeah. Just that simple. So stop, breathe, think, act. Just that easy. It's definitely not rocket science. Um, it's not a complicated thing to think about. So um, now, uh, um, a couple of things just to kind of be aware of that's kind of interesting 
Uh, I pulled this up from Dan, uh, dan.org. 89% of divers don't equalize the correct way. 29% of divers had to stay out of the water for weeks or months due to problem caused by equalizing. 6.3% of divers have gotten permanent ear damage due to problems with equalizing their ears. Those are huge statistics. So as we kind of think about that, I want you guys to always be aware the time to start equalizing your ears on, on our descent is immediately upon descent. As soon as your little head starts popping below the surface, I'd like you guys to go ahead. And, oh, did I lose you? I did lose you. Recording? Easy enough. So one of the things I want you guys to realize is that we start to do this. I want to make sure your ears are fine and it causes less problems. Please make sure you guys are equalizing immediately upon descent. As soon as your little head's got down, go ahead and start equalizing out. What we find is that a lot of 89% of divers that don't equalize correctly is a big, big number. So I just want you guys to be aware of that as well as we kind of go through this process. Let's see. Let me figure out where I'm at in my slide deck here. All righty. We talked about DCS already. I think we've kind of got that um, taken care of to clarity. Um, the other thing I want you guys to be aware of is most dive accidents can be avoided by remembering to avoid the terrible twos. Okay. Too deep, too long, and too fast. So make sure you plan your dive and dive your plan. Don't go deeper than your plan. Now, as we start doing our dive planning, one of the things I'd like you guys to start getting in, the, in, the, in your mind is always base your plan upon the contingency first. And here's how I plan my contingency. My contingency is always, what happens if I stay five minutes longer and go five feet deeper than what I plan? So I build my contingency based upon a five. <laughs> five. So I say, okay, if, as I'm doing my dive planning, could I do five more minutes and stay out of deco? Can I go five feet deeper and still have enough gas to be able to return to the surface? What happens if? So make sure as you're doing your dive planning that you don't stay too deep and too long and base your dive plan on a five by five. Um, that I always plan out my five feet longer, five feet or five minutes longer, five feet deeper first. And the last part of that is too fast. Make sure you're paying attention to your computer. One of the funniest things and saddest things I've ever heard, I was on a dive boat about a year and a half ago. And the young lady across from me, when as we began her dive, uh, pr proudly announced, this is my ninth dive. And I was like, well, and I went over to her and I says, mine too. And so I had a good time. But we came up after dive one and she says, can you help me? My, my computer was vibrating and buzzing and telling me to go up. I was so confused. I didn't know what to do. Oh, oh no. Not, my wife put her hand on my shoulder because she saw my head about to spin off, I'm sure. Um, <laughs> and we, I talked to her. Follow your dive computer. Watch your dive computer. On your ascent, if it's telling you to ascend, ascend. It's just that easy. But make sure you're not ascending faster than your slowest bubble or no faster than 30 feet per minute. Now, one of the things I'd like to encourage as you start going up in elevation, you're actually moving faster than you think. Um, depth becomes a greater distance. So as we start doing our ascents out at Ryrie, I'd like to see you guys do 25 feet or less per minute. You're ascending okay. faster than you think. Take your time. So don't ascend too fast. We're not going to stay too long. And remember, when um, when you guys get to 1,000, you're going to tell me 1,000, we're going to go ahead and start our ascent. We're going to go back up the shoreline. Just follow me. I, I, will have me I promise I will have uh, measured it out and know what direction to go. But I would like you guys to have that compass reading as well and keep navigation for yourself. Don't trust my navigation. Trust your own. Now, if you start going the wrong way, I still may grab you and take you the right way. But, <laughs> <Thank> um, <laughs> <laughs> but just be aware of that, uh, that that is definitely a real thing. Now, one of the nice things you can uh, you can do as well is you can get into a good dive computer. I don't know if you guys have dive computers now, um, but I definitely encourage having a nice dive computer. The history of them, they were originally designed for the Navy in the 70s. It was a very cool thing. They were top secret originally. Um, but they've come a long way. And this is uh, one of the dive computers that CHOP can sell. This is a, uh, a Suunto Eon Core. Very cool computer. It's very easy to see. Um, computers are designed to do one thing, really. They're designed to be able to monitor 
uh, based upon an algorithmic uh, calculation, the amount of nitrogen in your system. Now, that's what they're designed to do. And how they do that is they, they give you the depth and the time and the no deco time based upon that algorithm. But they've gotten a little slicker over the years. They'll also give you temperature, an ascent rate monitor, as well as a lot of them will tell you how much gas is in your tank. You guys will notice that tomorrow the, ca the computers that I have um, will are also monitoring my amount of gas uh, in my tank. So they get pretty slick and they do a lot of things. They'll also, if you're using nitrox, they'll monitor your, your CNS, your central nervous system toxicity and a and dose of oxygen as well. So they'll do a lot of really cool things and keep you out of trouble. So it's definitely to your advantage to get a good dive computer. Um, and it'll help with this quite a bit. Um, I, I'll be the first to admit that I follow a dive computer quite a bit. Other thing to do is be aware of as well is get yourself a dive uh, a dive chart and start planning your dives. You can also do this on your computer as well, but you can take a quick look at it and say, okay, we're going to do a 100-foot dive, which means we've got a total bottom time of 20 minutes. That's the max amount of time we can stay down at a 100-foot at dive. We can look at our dive plan and say, okay, we're doing a 60-minute dive. We can stay down for 50 minutes. 80-foot dive, 30 minutes. 100-foot dive, 20 minutes. Easy enough. So we'll plan our dives. So we're not only going to plan our dives based upon the amount of gas, but also based upon the NDL non-decompression limits as well. So it's definitely to your advantage to have a, a chart. Now, do you guys both have the My SSI app? Yes. Yes. Fantastic. Would you guys – oh, you're on your phone um, are you, do you have another no. phone that you can open it up? Yep. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind uh, on your other phone, would you please open up the My SSI app? I'll even do it with you. I'll turn off my camera or my uh, thing here. So I can move that over. There we go. So we got the My SSI app here. Now, if you wouldn't yep. mind, we're going to go down to more. And once you're at more, there is going to be a button that says tables. So if you oh. click on that, you'll see tables. What we are looking for is the combined air EAN tables. If you tap oh. on that, it'll ask you, please do that in English Imperial. It'll be to your advantage. English Imperial, and then select mm -hmm. Open. Oh, Imperial, not Metric. Yes, Imperial be to your, fr your friend. And once you're there, you can actually zoom in. And you have your whole dive tables right on your phone. You guys see that? Yeah, that's awesome. Absolutely. Now, there's a whole bunch of cool tables in there as well. <laughs> Um, as you start looking through that, you'll also know you notice you have altitude diving tables, best gas mixes, um, equivalent air depths, um, NOAA limits. Mine's hanging. David's is loading. My, mine's fine, though. <laughs> there you go. So you got all kinds of cool tables in there to look at, um, including this one. So take a look through that and, and definitely play with that. It's to your advantage. Um, there's all kinds of cool stuff in there. Um, training pathways, five-minute neuro exams in there, your altitude tables. Um, if you guys are interested in learning how to dive altitude, um, it's a great course. I, I do teach that one. I love teaching it. Um, and we go through all the specifics of how to dive at altitude and what to be aware of in your dive planning. So just be aware. Uh, that is a fantastic class. Def definitely love teaching that as well. All righty. Now, one of the things to be aware of, what happens, David, if your computer fails? Well, basically you ascend. It doesn't have to be like an emergency ascent, but you need to end the dive right then and make an ascent and then a safety stop and then come up. Sure, but how would you know what, how to, what your ascent is, what your time is? What would you do? So, well, yeah. Always let your smallest bubbles go faster than you. And then basically. Um, How do you know at 15 if you're at 15 feet? Uh, well, I've got a. Ooh, that's a good question. I guess. <laughs> I have an having, answer. I'm used to, I'm hoping you come I'm used up to with having it. my analog gauge um, for my depth gauge on my dive gear. So 
If now, David is really, really dead, then. David, does anybody else around you have a computer? Yeah. Yeah, usually. Could you use that to help determine depth, <laughs> set speed, and a safety stop time? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. So that's one thing that if you do have a computer failure, the first thing I do is I have two computers. If I have, and I have had a computer die on me at, at depth. Um, and usually it's just because it ran out of battery because then I was stupid. But two computers is the best way to go. Two full integrated computers. Um, but if you don't have that advantage, having an extra time to piece to your, is to your advantage. But you can also use your buddy's computer to get you back to the surface and help you do that. You just simply tell your buddy, hey, I'm out, going up, ending dive. Anybody can end a dive at any time for any reason without consequence. Your dive computer failing is absolutely a, cons is a consequence of, or a, uh, not a consequence, but a, uh, a reason to end a dive. Absolutely. Yep. So simple enough. All right, guys. So we covered a lot today. Um, yeah. Overall, we, we covered everything from how we trained, some expectations. We went through the exposure system. Um, we talked about buying the gear at the right place and getting it serviced correctly. Um, we talked about surface support. Um, we went through that pretty in depth, uh, accident management plans, service markers. Um, we gave you kind of a, a very complicated but very accurate way to measure your deep dive class or your uh, sack rate, I mean. And I gave you guys a homework assignment um, that you're going to plan out the amount of gas that's going to that you can dive at 60, 80, and 100 feet, as well as tomorrow night, how you can figure out your own actual sack rate. Um, we talked a little bit about flying after diving, um, some planning as well. We talked about ascent procedures, and then we talked about a safety stop to make sure that we're doing at least one minute at 20 feet and four minutes at 10 feet, or at least a total of a five-minute safety stop to slow down during. We talked a little bit about uh, M values and, and the values of safety stops as well. Um, we talked about DCS and some uh, basic dive maladies as well. Um, and then we talked a lot about nitrogen narcosis, which is probably one of the more common things we deal with and learned that nitrogen narcosis really is an effect of internal factors and create and a lot of internal factors cr uh, create the predisposing factors of why of how nitrogen narcosis happens. Right. Talked a little bit about dive computers. Dive computers are definitely your friend. I, I have a bunch of dive computers. I, I use them. You can see one. I've got one right right there on, uh, behind me. That's that's a Shearwater Perdix. I've got other ones here as well. Um, and you'll always see me wear at least two dive computers. Um, we talked a little decompression theory, and we ended with what happens if our computer fails. Guys, what questions do you have? So I have a question, and David might okay. know this. But, um, in in the on the dive tables, actually, mm -hmm. um, in this sheet at the bottom. And, so at the bottom here, it kind of shows, I don't know if you can see that, kind of shows like this little chart down here. This kinda chart right here. Go up. Or Not that one. So the, the repetitive dive? Yeah, this, this one. Oh, yeah, the repetitive dive. Yeah, that. So I didn't understand like what C means or D or H gotcha. under the or G. What is that? I didn't gotcha. So there's three dive tables. There's dive table one, two, and three. The first thing we need to do is we figure out, for example, we did a 60 foot dive for 50 minutes. That makes us an H group diver. Oh, okay. And so what I we do is we come over and down. And once we, we determine we're H group diver, we can come down and we can say, okay, if I stay out of the water for uh, one hour and seven minutes, I, I change to an F group diver. Okay. Once I know that I'm an F group diver, I'm a, I go to cha chapter three or uh, table three and I can follow uh -huh. F down. And I can say, okay, as an F group diver, um, uh -huh. going to 50 feet, I have 47 minutes of um, penalty time and I can do a 23 minute dive. White uh -huh. is penalty. Green is go. Green is my actual dive amount of dive time I can do because of the residual nitrogen in my system. Okay. So it's kind of funny that she has this question and the fact that, so when we got Pat, well, when we got them Patty certified, Patty is all about using the computers and they're not used to using dive tables. And so that was one of my biggest complaints was that 
didn't teach dive tables with Patty. And it sounds like it would be to our advantage to usually the dive table conversations a, a good half hour at least of okay. that. So why don't we plan on meeting up? And I will happily give you guys a half hour, 45 minutes of actual just dive table practice. Okay. That would I be mean, good for me. I'm used to, I still have a, on my phone, I actually, well, I still have my original dive tables. But I mean, I even keep a photo of my dive tables on my phone just, just so I have sure. them. Absolutely. So, yeah, let's plan on meeting up and going through and just doing a dive table class. So okay. I'm happy to do that. Absolutely. I'd I'd like to be more comfortable with those. Not a problem. Um, okay. I, I definitely, I use those and I use my dive planning. I actually have some dive planning software as well. So as you start getting up uh, farther along in the uh, the cycle of diving, here, I'll launch it and show you what I actually use. Let's see. Okay. Um, just take me a second. I just launched it. So it's, it's coming up now. And there's a lot of different dive planning software out there. So I use... This is one of the two that I use. Uh, let's see, share, present. Come on. Uh, share screen, window. And this one's completely free. This is called Subsurface. Hmm. And how it works is simply, let's see, plan dive. And this is a this is basically what a dive is going to look like. So we're going to do a dive at 5,000 feet. And I want to go down to 80 feet. It's going to take me three minutes to get there. I'm going to stay at 80 feet for 19 minutes. There's okay. my dive plan right over here. 80 feet for three takes me three minutes to get down there. I'm going to be down there for 19 minutes. I'm going to send. It's going to take me two minutes to get to 20 feet. And I'm going to remain at tw 20 feet for two minutes. Oh, okay. So there's actually dive planning. And, I, and then I have a really easy one that I use as well. Let's see. This. Um, there is actually an app, um, and it looks like, if we find it here, take me a second. Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Where'd it go? Um, you can tell I must use it a lot, apparently. Um, oh, there it is. It is called uh, Dive Plan. I actually bought it. Uh, there's a free version of it as well. And you just say, I want to uh, uh, cancel. Uh, I want to do it in feet. I hit start, and then. Okay. Uh, there we go. There we go. And you there can. You there we go. And oh, you can wow. simply. Uh, you can plan. This is set up for dive one, and you just slide through and say, "I'm going to do." You know, a 65 minute dive for. Okay, default to the 80, 80 foot, thing or 80 leap, whatever you call it. Um, it, it defaults to 21 percent nitrox. Uh, or 21% air, but you can change that okay. as well. And then it gives you all your information on that, and you can actually plan yep. uh, plan additional dives. So okay. um, it's I think I paid 10 bucks for it. Nice. Uh, I was just curious. Um, but it's a, a little dive plan software. And every any dive computer you have should have a planning mode on it as well. So you should be able to go into your dive computer and actually plan your dive. Okay. Easy yeah, enough? Just, yeah. Okay. That's that was my question. So no worries. Really? But yeah, let's get together. And let's do some uh, dive planning. Let's just uh, spend some time and uh, just do some basic dive planning. We'll use the charts and help you understand and get comfortable with it. It's easy. Okay. Perfect. All right. What are the questions? I can get it in different languages. That just not U.S. Imperial. That's so. He's funny. still trying to get the dive tables on. His my phone. dive tables on my phone won't open. Oh no! Try restart the your phone. Yeah, we. I tried restarting the did. phone already. It still won't. Something with the app, it won't let me open the U.S. Imperial, but it lets me open up other languages and English mm -hmm. metric. Weird. <laughs> if you'd like, yeah. I can get it for you in Arabic. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I can get <laughs> Dutch, Greek, Italian, Japanese. <laughs> kind of funny. Cool. One of the things you don't realize is you guys already know how to write Arabic. Um, the number system we use is Arabic. One oh, really? Yeah. That's that's actually oh. Arabic. <laughs> Trivia for the day. Right. Perfect. What other questions do you guys have? Um, we're meeting at eleven thirty. Meet at eleven thirty. Did, did, yeah. Um, so 
the dive table training? Did you want to do that before we dive? Just kind of. No, I'm gonna. I'm gonna we're gonna. Um, I don't have the time to do it tonight, and uh, I'm getting a little on the bake side, and I've got to get up early in the morning. Um, okay. But uh, let's meet up next week, and we'll sit down and let's do it. Okay. I'll find some open time in my schedule. All right. Okay. Easy enough. Okay. We'll get Perfect. All right. What other questions you guys have? I don't have any. Should you have more questions? Don't be afraid to text, oh, write, email, or call. So the, the other one question I have is um, the fact that we are at a little bit of elevation, or roughly 5,000. Mm -hmm. um, does that play into it much? or Some, yes. Absolutely. And that's a longer conversation. I have an altitude diving class that I will happily uh, uh, work with you. It's about a three-hour class, and it'll help you understand that better. Um, for okay. a period of what we're doing tomorrow, um, I'm not I'm not going to worry too much about it, and I, I will take into consideration that as well already. But it does take into consideration. You'll be diving deeper than what you think. Um, we're diving roughly 24 percent deeper than what you think. So if we're doing a 60 foot dive, we're actually doing a 73 foot dive. So okay, because I was going to say it's freshwater, not saltwater, right? We're that doing was... freshwater, but altitude with the atmospheric correction. Uh, for theoretical depth, um, we're doing oh, a deeper. Okay, dive. Okay. Yeah, we're about twenty four percent, twenty three percent deeper. Okay. All right. So the Easy other enough. course we're doing, are we doing that completely separate? The deco diving. Yes. And... Yes, okay. I want to get you guys. I want to get you guys through this, um, and uh, we kind of made that decision to start with this and see what we need after this because the deco diving is a lot like this, but. Um, Gail, I wanted to make sure you were comfortable. Thank you. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, there, there's, there is no hurry to get these courses done. None whatsoever. Right. Let's get through this. And part of that other course, we're going to do some deco planning as well, or, or, and uh, some dive planning as well. So we're going to have to go through those charts again as well. So okay. we're going to go through them. But I want to see where we're at tomorrow to, to know what I need to work with. So tomorrow, if we, you know, if I get done with the 80 foot dive and i'm like okay i think i'm having a little bit of a rough time is there a possibility to like stop and pause and do of another course. dive later of Thanks. course anybody can end a dive at any time for any reason without consequence okay if you tell me you're not ready to go the 100 foot i will absolutely respect that okay all right okay i think yeah exactly we're good yeah, don't worry. It's, there's no stress and there's no worry. We're on lake time, so we'll we'll get it done when we get it done. It's like I tell you, uh, <laughs> we start the dives when, when we get in the water. What time is that, Will? When we get in the water is what time it is. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I like it, too. Yeah, relax. It's no big deal. Thanks. I got you covered. All right. So one question I have. Sure. Do you mind being called Ben, or do you just do you prefer Benjamin? I prefer Benjamin, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, my dad okay. was ben and my grandfather was Ben. I am actually the fifth, believe it or not. Wow. So, oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. See, and right. with David, he doesn't care, but I prefer calling him David. But okay. a lot of people call him Dave. So whatever. He doesn't care, though. Okay. As long as you don't I just care. Wanted to know. I just wanted to know so to know. I can. Absolutely. Okay. All right. I'll answer to almost anything. Um, uh, my friends call me Skip sometimes. Um, I, I My call sign in the Marine Corps was Crash. So you, any of those, <laughs> any of those nice. work. So. <laughs> okay. Um, I've got guy, friends that call me, still call me captain. So you can call me captain. Yeah. You can call me skip, skipper, um, or a crash. I, I'll answer to any of that or Benjamin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All still right. Don't late to dessert. I like dessert. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares about dinner? <laughs> what the hell with dinner? I want dessert. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> All right. We're excited. Right, we'll see you.